We have a keynote speaker who is truly a, a thought leader in, in the healthcare space, and she's followed by two, not one, but two panels of, of other uh, thought leaders in the healthcare space. And you know, I, I was looking at these six individuals, and I think any one of them would be a great keynote for kind of a week-long program anywhere on healthcare or healthcare reform, and, and we're fortunate that we've got all six. Our, our challenge, I think, is going to be that we're in two hours, we're here to try to pull as much of the depth and the breadth of all the, their knowledge on the topic out so that we can arrive with some good insights as we go forward. But I'm quite confident that they are very adept at doing that. So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Regina Herzlinger, who is the Nancy R. McPherson Professor for Business Administration here at the Business School at Harvard. Uh, she was the first chaired and tenured professor at the Business School at Harvard, no small feat, uh, and, and has been a truly recognized as, universally as uh, an expert in healthcare and healthcare reform. Uh, she has published articles that are too numerous to, 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 to recite, multiple books on, this, on the topic, all of which have been bestsellers. Uh, she has been recognized as kind of the mother, if you will, of the concept of <laughs> consumerism in healthcare, uh, which is a, a, coin, a, a term that she coined herself. And uh, she's here to share some of her insights with us right now on, um, on healthcare and, and where we are right now, and perhaps a, a bit of an idea on path forward. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hitzlinger. Thanks. Uh, thanks so very much. I'm thrilled to be here and honored uh, to be here among all these hugely distinguished and accomplished people. I had a bet with myself as I headed here that these six of us would be having a lovely time together. <laughs> the speaker and the other five panelists and moderators, so I'm really, you're truly stalwart. My hat's off to you, my brain hat is off to you. So I'm not going to be talking about who killed healthcare, but it is the title of my latest book which is available in Amazon and uh, Barnes and & Noble. And I am a professor of business, so I can't help but make a pitch for it. Uh, I, I was not the first professor. Um, I am not in the blush of youth. But the Harvard Business School is more than 100 years old. so. Uh, you know, I'm not that old. Uh, <laughs> but I was thrilled to be the first woman a tenured year, and of course many women of my age, middle 30s, are the first to have achieved whatever they did. And I also was the first woman to receive a chair here, and it was a hilarious experience. The dean, John MacArthur, our great dean, came to see me and he said, I have a chair for you. And I looked around and he said, the chair is named for a woman. And it would be the first chair given to a woman, named for a woman. It's OK if you don't want it, you know? That was in the days uh, when these things were like walking on eggshells. Of course, I was thrilled to get it. I'm the Nancy McPherson professor. Her husband, Bren McPherson, was an extraordinary man who came here uh, straight out of high school. He'd gone to World War II, very distinguished uh, warrior, and led uh, the great Dana Corporation. So what will I be talking about? I'm going to be talking about what I believe will be the consumer-driven cure for healthcare and the opportunity it creates for people who are innovative. So I have a disclosure form here. If you ever go to medical things, uh, they always have the disclosure forms. So I do have two speaker bureaus who represent me. And if they ever told me what to say, I would shoot them dead. So that is my disclosure. So healthcare is very curious, always discussed as if it were a problem, but in fact, we have wonderful physicians, uh, some of whom are here. We have great hospitals. We have great insurance uh, executives and great insurance companies like Jim uh, Roosevelt's Tufts. 
Uh, Jim has just entered the room, but what we have, which is really, to me, hugely important, is medicine is much more art than science, and a very common phrase, uh, word in medicine is idiopathic meaning not that you're an idiot, but that, although it might mean that, uh, but that really we don't know what the cause is. And the reason we don't know what the cause is is it's a relatively weak science. Compared to a science like physics, which is so incredibly strong that the physicist could predict the existence of a town neutrino, whatever the hell that is, and then they actually went out and found it. We don't have that kind of cause and effect uh, strength in the science underlying the practice of medicine, but genomics will change all that. And many of the things that are now viewed as idiopathic are clearly genetically linked, and the unraveling of the genome and the ability to discover mutated genes that cause diseases to diagnose them and hopefully even to discover remedies that could correct these mutations will convert medicine from being an art to being a science and vastly increase its power to improve human life. So we have great doctors, we have great hospitals, we have great insurance uh, systems, we have this incredible, in my own view, the great sciences of the 21st century are clearly in biochemistry and high technology. So what is the problem with medicine? Why is healthcare always discussed healthcare problem, healthcare crisis, when there's so much that's wonderful about it? So there are three problems. One are the costs of healthcare. One is the quality and the third is the access, the ability of people to actually use this great medical care system that we have. So here's a chart that experts put up so they remain experts, totally unreadable. Uh, so what this chart, and I'm gonna go back to it over and over again just in case you're feeling uh, that the talk is simplistic, I'll keep, which may well be, I'll keep, keep popping up to this. So the fourth column of numbers shows the compounded average growth rate of healthcare expenditures per capita adjusted for U.S. purchasing power in various countries. And if you contrast it to the fifth column, which is the compounded uh, growth rate, average growth rate of the GDP. In virtually all countries, the rate of growth of healthcare vastly outstrips the rate of growth of the GDP. That is not a sustainable situation, particularly in the United States where our GDP grew from by about 4.7%, that's the bottom right-hand column in the sea of numbers from 2000 to 2008. But our healthcare costs, which are already monumentally huge at about 17% of GDP as opposed to 10 in developed nations, um, it cannot continue to grow. It, it puts our economy in grave jeopardy. Why does it put our economy in jeopardy? Well, here's some data from the Medicare trustees report. Federal government uh, does not use accrual accounting. That means it recognizes a liability only when somebody comes around, sticks their hand out, and says, you owe me money. But what about all of us who've paid in the Medi into Medicare in the belief that we will receive services in exchange for our payments? Well, Medicare would love to pay you all that's standing between them and paying you for Medicare Part A, which is the hospitalization part of Medicare, is $37 trillion. The net present value of the unfunded deficit for Part B, which is physicians, another $37 trillion. Part D, which is the pharmaceutical part, is $16 trillion. So 
3434, that's 68 and 16. Uh, we're talking over $80 trillion net present value, unfunded liabilities. What does this number mean? You know, it's mind boggling, especially on a rainy Saturday afternoon where you're thinking about the Celtics game. So what, what does this number mean? The GDP of the United States is between 12 and $14 trillion. So this is a, a huge number, a ghastly number. Who's going to pay this money? Well, it's going to be our children, our grandchildren. Here you go. Here's a gift, $80 trillion unfunded liability. Uh, we are not unique with this unfunded liability. Here is another, another chart, another unreadable chart. Uh, that uh, depicts the unfunded liabilities of various countries. So not surprisingly, Portugal and Greece are two and three from the bottom. I don't know what happened to Malta. It should be there, but it's not. So you know that they're bankrupt. The average European, they have, in order to amortize their unfunded liabilities, they would have to spend 10% of their GDP annually. Uh, the average European country would have to spend 8.4%, one out of every $12, to fund their unfunded liabilities, promises of social benefits that people have either paid taxes or paid fees for in the belief that they will receive them, for which they do not have the money. The U.S. is a little worse than Europe at 8.6%. But that's not our only problem. The unfunded liability, I would say, of course, I'm an economist, so I know the price of everything, the value of nothing. But I would say this is a very serious financial problem, not a laughable problem, and we cannot grow our way out of it. But we have an additional problem that's unique almost unique to the United States, and that is, unlike many countries, the uh, still the bulk, the majority of health care costs are paid through employers. And uh, so my employer, my brilliant employer, takes $26,000 of what would otherwise be my salary, half my salary. Just checking, you know. <laughs> Woman's voice, late and dark. So I do earn more than 52. So not much more, but I do earn more than that. So they take $26,000 and they use it to buy my health insurance. $26,000, just to calibrate this number, the median household income in the United States, $50,000, an enormous amount of money. Why do I let them do it? Well, the only reason I let them do it is they can use my income tax-free to buy my health insurance. And if I said to them instead, cash me out, I'll buy my own health insurance, it would be a very bad deal because I would get taxed on that income. In Massachusetts, great state, but our taxes, mm, I would have, of that 26, about $15,000 left over. So even though my employer, who is so much more brilliant than I, but not more brilliant than I in buying my clothes, in buying my food, in buying my home, in the health insurance, too, they really don't know what I want, but I want them to buy it because of this tax exclusion. So I'm not lobotomizing you on this subject because I'm sadistic. I'm going to come back to it. It's a very important aspect of it. So our employers pay for health insurance, and unlike uh, the UK, where health insurance is paid for the public part, through broad-based taxes, or many European countries, and even a country like Brazil. We pay for it, and we're unusual, through the private sector, which means these businesses have to compound the costs of health insurance into the costs of the goods and products they sell. 
and we have by far the costliest system in the world. So General Motors contends that it spends $1,600 per car on health care, and Toyota spends $100 per car. Uh, I would not vouch for the veracity of these numbers, because for many years, General Motors has lobbied for a single-payer system. Not that it loves single-payer or doesn't love single-payer. It hasn't done this openly, but it's argued for it. But it would like to get these costs off its back. And the reason it wants to get its, these costs off its back is, let's say, the right differential between Gen General Motors and Toyota is not 1500 but $1,000 of health care costs per car. How can General Motors possibly engineer $1,000 out of the cost of the car other than health care and remain competitive with Toyota? Toyota, to date, is the highest quality car, sells at the same price as General Motors. It's impossible. And anyway, Toyota is not going to be dominant in the automobile industry. Seems to me the industry is going to the Koreans, the Chinese, and the Indians. So how much Tata Motors, this brilliant company, you can buy a car from Tata Motors for $2,200. Probably not a car you'd want to buy, but I expect in a few years they'll sell you a car at 5000 bucks. That will be a perfectly acceptable car. How much health care goes into that car? I don't know. But the Indians spend $50 per person per year in health care. So it's a minuscule number, and we're in a globally competitive economy. Our employer-based health insurance systems also are problematic because they lead to job loss. So the uninsured in the United States are mostly employed, but they're employed by small businesses that by and large do not offer health insurance. How many people do you know who've said to you, you know, I'd love to leave my job in a big company and go to work for this startup, which is so interesting and fun, but I can't because of the benefits. The benefits is health insurance. Big companies, 99% offer, other than McDonald's and some banks um, and Walmart, offer health insurance, small companies, only about two-thirds of them offer health insurance. So what's the big deal? Well, 75% of the job growth in the United States comes from small companies. And if we artificially keep people into big companies that are not productive, we're distorting the allocation of labor in the economy. Furthermore, we give American employers, as the cost of health insurance goes up, what, what are they thinking? Well, you don't need a PhD in econometrics to figure out that the CEO of a company is thinking, if I hire her in addition to her salary and vacation and blah, 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 she's going to carry about $18,000 in health insurance. If I go to India, all goes away, and they're smarter than her anyway. And um, then they are also very tempted to substitute capital for labor. So in the economy with record unemployment and not terrifically good news, about where the unemployment numbers are going, the employer-based health insurance system is a problem. Second problem is quality. Um, I know more about this bottle of water or the yogurt that I eat for breakfast than I would know about the surgeon or hospital in which I would have a mastectomy done. I would know virtually nothing about them. I would think they're pretty good. I would know doctors who practice there. But would I have the same kind of data that would make me feel comfortable about their quality? No. 
Quality is mostly reputational to me that is scandalous in an area as important as healthcare. In addition, there are 100,000 hospital deaths a year. This statistic has remained almost immutable for decades. And uh, in other industries, it would be it would be unthinkable that year after year after year there would be so many deaths. And quality is based, the quality metrics that exist are based on process. Did the doctor give you an antibiotic before surgery? Did she prescribe an aspirin? Did she tell you to stop smoking? That's very important. But when I buy a car, am I interested in how they made that car? Or am I interested in how many miles per gallon the car gets? Am I interested in what happens if I ram into a wall at 30 miles an hour? Am I interested in its, uh, its fuel economy, its environmental efficiency? I'm much more interested in that. I want to know how good that car is now, not how it's made. But quality is primarily based on process. The last problem is the problem of access. And of course, here in the United States, which is the richest economy in the world uh, still for a while, and likely the richest economy that ever existed, we have this shameful problem of 50 million uninsured, many of whom cannot get good access to health care. Now, does Universal coverage, would it help them? Of course, and there are very good economic reasons for universal coverage. But universal coverage does not mean universal access. So people who are on Medicaid are health insurance for the poor. In some states, 60% of doctors refuse to see them. In the UK, which uh, went to universal coverage after World War II, there have been two, uh, I laud their honesty, two reports about the inequity between the rich and the poor when it comes to getting health care. Rich people, assertive people, aggressive people, people who look like they might look be litigious, they go to the head of the line. The other people get left at the end of the line. I was just in Brazil. And in Brazil, which allegedly has a universal coverage system, about 44% of the Brazilians have private insurance. 56% of the Irish have private insurance. 43% of the French have Irish, have, uh, they don't have Irish, they have private <laughs> insurance. 33% of the Spanish have private insurance. So why is that? It's because the public system is very difficult to access. There are huge waiting lists and people who can afford to pay their way out of it, they pay their way out of it. So universal coverage is no panacea when it comes to access. These data are really shameful. 14% of the people in Brazil who have university degrees go to the public health systems, compared to 74% of people who didn't complete elementary school. It's hugely inequitable, and that is true of many universal coverage systems, not to say that our situation is excusable, but just providing coverage does not guarantee access. So what are some of the solutions to these problems? Well, one solution is to create a single payer system where the government is the single payer for health care. Virtually all of the single payer systems but for Canada have an escape clause, and the escape clause is you can buy private health insurance. And as I've just told you, those who can afford to do it by and large do do it. Still, single payer, the idea is the government will run the health care system, it will supplant the private health insurance systems. 
who use from 12 to 20 percent of their revenues on administration and profit and will eliminate that unnecessary expenditure. The U.S., uh, I do not believe, will go to single payer, not any time soon, and in a moment I'll explain why. And in the uh, reform legislation, PPACA, as it's catchingly called, uh, we instead opted for a kind of public-private solution where uninsured people can go to a government-run insurance supermarket and they gave it and buy health insurance that is offered by private insurers. And they gave it a name uh, that is sure to completely obfuscate what it does. They called it the exchange. Here in Massachusetts, we call it the connector. But it's a political attempt to straddle private public sector interests in the United States. So let me talk about the um, costs and access in single payer and in the um, government run supermarkets. So how are costs controlled in the economy? Um, when I was a young woman, I graduated from MIT, barely, but I did graduate. And one of the reasons I barely graduated, other than being very distracted, is that I had to program a computer to graduate. The computer was a PDP-11. Nobody in this room knows what that is. It was a DEC mini computer. Nah, you're too young. It was a DEC, <laughs> DEC mini computer. The, the word, the adjective mini is completely inappropriate. The machine was housed in a room about this size. It cost about 150,000 then, which would mean about three million now. It was, oh, it was such a pain. Uh, the room had to be sterile. So to approach this machine, I had to wear, you know, hat and a booty as if I were going in for surgery. And the only reason I would want to get anywhere near this machine was that it could not accept instructions from a keyboard. I had to punch cards and feed it into this machine. And Massachusetts, as you see today, is very moist. So these cards would furl up. And <laughs> the machine would, I hated that, would spit it out, you know, like a uh, temperamental child. And what was I punching on those cards? I was writing a program in a foreign language, which I had to learn, which I use daily. And it was called COBOL. So um, the program I had to solve was so, the problem was so trivial, I could have, even I could have heuristically solved it in about two hours. But it took me months to program the damn thing. I never did get it right, but I think they just felt sorry for me and said, let's get her out of here. So here in this vast container that I euphemistically call my purse, I have, uh, you know, women don't carry purses. They carry things that hold their computers. So. I have my Dell laptop in there, but I also have this. So this is my iPhone. My iPhone, I overpaid for it because I paid something for it. Uh, so, <laughs> but I paid $199 for it, uh, quite a bit lower than the $3 million. It has 10 to the 90th the computing capacity of the DEC uh, mini computer. It's very friendly, so I just type and it does whatever the hell it does and it answers me back. My purse is not sterile, I assure you. <laughs> so um, how did this happen? Now, the reason I focus on computers, there are other industries that have become 
better and cheaper. And the dominant one is the retailing industry. Retailing actually is an industry that's led the growth in productivity in the United States, a service industry through the innovations of Sam Walton in making retailing IT connected and in retailing innovations like redesigning stores. So, you know, the department stores are all going bankrupt and what supplanted them are stores that cater to particular lifestyles. So when I wanted to buy a dark jacket that's long and covers my <laughs> hips that goes with the other 80 million dark long jackets that are hanging in my closet, I used to go to a department store and go to a department was called career dressing. Career dressing meant dark, jackets that are long <laughs> for ladies with hips. So now I need some pants and I need some shoes and I need hosiery and I need underwear and I need a lot of other I need earrings. So I would wend my way all through this department store. Nothing was next to each other. I'd get spritzed with perfume and be offered tons of makeup as I went. So it's hugely inefficient process. What supplanted that store is Talbots or upscale or downscale versions of that. And these are focused stores that give busy people everything they need for their lifestyles. If you think about the difference in, in complexity of running a department store, retailing is very hard, and running a focused lifestyle, bless you, store, Clearly, the focused lifestyle store is easier to run, and it's a great cause of productivity. But what happened in the computer industry? Why am I focusing on them? Because most people, we understand retailing more or less. But how a computer works, I'll be damned if I know. I have no idea. How did the deck get to be this thing? No idea. So most people who buy computers, no idea. So how is it that an industry that is filled with morons, uh, not moronic in general, but moronic about this very complex good, got to be better and cheaper? Well, the answer is it's consumer driven. So I pay a lot of attention. I'm very dependent on these things. And I pay a lot of attention to what's going on. So how does a dumbbell like me get smart? Well, I read Walter Mossberg in the Wall Street Journal. And I read him because he's a journalist. He's not one of these IT types where after a conversation with them, you say, what did they say? <laughs> you don't want to be rude to their faces, but what did they say? Uh, Mossberg's a journalist. Mossberg makes a million dollars a year. I don't care because I get my Wall Street Journal for free. Why does he get paid a million dollars a year? Because a lot of people like me read the journal to read Walter Mossberg so that they can be smart about buying computers. My point is that two things happen that make things better and cheaper. One is the consumer is directly involved. And if the good or service is very complicated, these intermediaries emerge like Mossberg or consumer reports that make complicated things clearer to the consumer. So who actually makes it better and cheaper, however? It's not me and it's not Walter Mossberg. So another thing that happens in these industries is these quirky geniuses emerge. Let's think about Sam Walton. Sam Walton shows up and he says, I've got a great idea. I'm going to build huge stores in rural Oklahoma. Right? So you're thinking, God, you're as thick as a brick, right? How <laughs> did anybody hear anything so stupid? Turned out not so stupid. So who who are these people in the computer industry? Well, clearly Gates is one of these people. 
with the uh, development of a more or less monopolistic operating system. Steve Jobs is another one of these people, probably more artists than IT type, with a very viable competitor to Microsoft in the Apple software. Michael Dell is another one of these guys. So Dell, I don't think, is an IT type at all. He's a retailer, you know, and he had an idea about how to sell the computers more cheaply. So if you're a government-run system, are these people going to emerge? You're not consumer-driven. You don't have Walter Mossberg writing about what's good and what's not good. Are, are Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, Sam Walton, are they going to pop up with ideas about how to make it better and cheaper? Very dubious. Entrepreneurs are typically narcissistic, egotistical, self-driven. They do not play nicely with the other children. And the idea of their functioning well in a big bureaucracy seems to me a pipe dream. So how do you make it better and cheaper? Well, one way is you get rid of the insurers. But another way is you all know the 80-20 rule. So the 80-20 rule is called Pareto's Law. You've heard of Pareto if you took any economics courses. He had a lot of laws. But the really cool, he was a very brilliant Italian economist, the really good Pareto Law is the 80-20 rule. So 80% of anything is caused by 20% of the possible causes. For example, 80% of the clothes you wear come from 20% of what's hanging in your closet, probably. Here, it, that may not be true individually, but it's true for a group. Here's another one. 80% of the beer in the United States is drunk by 16% of the beer drinkers. And as a long-term teacher here, I know every single one of them. <laughs> so is healthcare very well? So is healthcare 80-20? Yeah. 80% of the costs are incurred by 20% of the people. They're very sick. Most of the people don't spend any money at all. So you're running a single payer system, Bill Gates not pounding on your door. And even if he were, you would slam that door because he's clearly going to be a pain in the neck. So how are you going to make things better and cheaper? Well, you got rid of the insurers, but there's the 80-20. So politically, you can annoy the 80% of the people who incur 20% of the costs. That would be political suicide. Or you can focus on the 20% who incur 80% of the cost. So here's some data about end-stage renal disease patients treated with dialysis per 100,000 population. Dialysis is an artificial kidney and stage real renal disease in the cruel nomenclature of medicine means you're dying because your kidneys are shot. One of my favorite cruel medical phrases is incompetent cervix. Uh, okay. So end-stage renal disease patients treated with dialysis. Dialysis costs from $30,000 to $50,000 a year for most people. They cannot afford it themselves. And if they don't have it and they have end-stage renal disease, they will die. UK, 63 per 100,000. OECD, relatively similar demographics, 93 per 100,000. US, 161 per 100,000. I just met a 96-year-old woman who was going on dialysis. So one could argue that if there were rational decision making, perhaps we do too much dialysis. But I very much doubt that the American public would stand for the stringency and the cost effectiveness analysis that has led to the 63 per 100,000. 
breast and prostate cancer age-adjusted death rates. These data come from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. 26 per 100,000 for breast UK, 24.7 OECD, 20.5 per 100,000 US. So you might say, well, you know, these drugs are incredibly expensive. These are the early stage genomic drugs and they're hugely expensive and they don't prolong life by that much. So I could live with the UK statistics. Uh, you might say this if you're not a woman um, or if that woman is not your mother or your wife, assuming you like them. Uh, but again, I don't think that this would be acceptable in the United States. What am I talking about? The Brits are among the wealthiest people in the world. We don't think so because of the teeth. <laughs> I don't mean that. They are gorgeous people, but they are very wealthy people. The UK takes up cancer drugs, these very expensive drugs, now, you know, any new technology, when it starts, is hugely expensive, and with time and use, those costs go down. The UK picks up those cancer drugs as this, at the same rate as the Czech Republic, which is a much poorer country. So it's a different model of healthcare, one which would be, for me, very difficult to see being applied in the US. What about the health insurance supermarket? So we have one in Massachusetts, and one aspect of the supermarket is the government decides what benefits, what the things I buy have to contain. So one thing that I have to buy is in vitro fertilization. Little late for me. So. I don't mind. There are a lot of things I buy that I think will be of no benefit to me, but they will help somebody else, and that's the nature of insurance. So why do I focus on in vitro fertilization? First, and which many of my students need, and which is so horrendously expensive, and I have a lot of sympathy for them, but it's not clear to me it's a medical issue. One could have a debate about whether in vitro fertilization is medical, but we can't have that debate. The government has said it's going to be in every single package. And then it's so expensive that it adds 5% to costs. So it raises my health insurance costs by about $1,000. I don't care. I'm happy to do this. But how many people do not buy health insurance because these benefits are in there that raise the entire package of insurance beyond their means? So um, the state of Florida mandated massages as a benefit. And oddly enough, this mandating came about just as a group of masseuses uh, descended on the Florida legislature. They gave everybody a massage, and therefore you have a benefit. So suppose the government dictated what kind of car options we should have. I believe that every car would have a heated seat, even down in Florida, because the car manufacturers would go to the legislature and say, you know, we're such a thin group of people that our little tushies might get frozen in the probability that there is a frost in Florida. So that is one problem with a health insurance supermarket. There's a limited choice of plans. You might say, well, what are you talking about? There are no rich innovations, health insurance. I'm going to show you some innovations very soon. Country of Holland has had an exchange or a health insurance supermarket for the entire country since 2006. What happened? First thing that happened is the insurers in Holland consolidated. And there are three insurers, or four of them, who control 90% of the market. 
When the health insurers consolidated, what happened? Well, the providers consolidated. They didn't want to get pushed around by these big insurers, so they merged as well. If you have big insurance plans and big healthcare systems, competitive markets are virtually impossible. Prices go up and the government steps in to control healthcare costs. That's what happened in Holland, and we're seeing this beginning to happen in Massachusetts. So I told you I'd go back to this miserable chart. Does an exchange with a connector and a market, which the Dutch have had since 2006, does it control costs? No. The rate of increase of costs in that great country, 7.14%, outstrips the rate of increase in the United States, clearly not a desirable outcome. Even in the UK, the rate of increase outstripped the rate of increase in the US because Tony Blair, who was then premier, uh, the prime minister, uh, felt compelled to reduce these waiting lists for the poor by massively increasing the capacity of the healthcare system. So what are we left with? We're not going to go single payer. The exchange to me is a very dubious solution to the cost problems. And as I told you, there are equality problems in universal coverage system. Quality is unknown everywhere. So I believe we are going to go to a consumer-driven system. So what does this mean? Harvard cashes me out, gives me my $26,000 back. A tax law is passed that makes, makes my receipt of the $20, $26,000 tax neutral for the amount that I spend on health insurance. So I get $26,000 back. I could stay with Harvard. I don't want to. Take the 26, I buy my own health insurance. I would probably spend 18,000 on my health insurance. That remains tax-free. The remainder, 26 minus 18, $8,000 is taxed. I've simulated this, and it would raise about $200 billion in taxes, along with creating a consumer-driven market. So what happens here? I'm buying my own health insurance. How am I going to make health care better, cheaper, and more equitable? That's ridiculous. Well, let me tell you how that might happen. First of all, when I buy insurance, there are going to be very different kinds of insurance policies. Um, policies that make healthcare better and cheaper. And the second thing is just like the retailing industry got reorganized to become better and cheaper with big box stores like Walmart and tailored lifestyle stores like Talbot's, and overall retailing became more productive, the healthcare industry will reorganize itself. So what's the first part? I bought my own health insurance, new insurance policies emerge. What's the second part? If I had diabetes, if I had AIDS, if I had cancer, I would be looking for a very different kind of healthcare delivery system. So when I have any of these diseases, these are the diseases, the handful that account for 80% of healthcare costs. I don't have diabetes. Actually, the number one cost of diabetes is heart disease. I have kidney disease. I have um, neuropathy. Um, my, I've lost sensation in uh, parts of the body that are farthest away from my heart. I have ulcers that don't heal because I have such poor circulation. I'm terribly depressed because it's such a hard disease, and I have to run all over town to find people who will deliver care for this disease. 
So if I were buying health insurance, what would I look for? I'd be looking for an integrated team that talks to each other and that does everything I need for my AIDS, for my diabetes, for my congestive heart failure. And there are many studies that show that when the providers get integrated and actually start communicating with each other, which is what consumers want, healthcare costs go down and quality goes up. So consumer-driven healthcare will lead to innovations. So is there a consumer-driven system in the world? In other words, a system which has universal coverage but doesn't have Medicare, doesn't have Medicaid, all the insurance is bought by consumers, by us. Well, there is one. It is the country of Switzerland, fortunately a non-WACO country. So if you're in Switzerland, you will have to buy your own health insurance. They have no Medicare, they have no Medicaid. That means I could not put up a slide with a 90 trillion dollar unfunded liability for Switzerland, they do not have that. What happens if you're poor in Switzerland? Well, you get as much money as the average Swiss, and you go and buy your own private health insurance. When you buy, a poor person buys private health insurance, which is the same as everybody else's health insurance, they're not treated as if they're poor. They're treated as if they're like everybody else. You know what the Gini coefficient is? It is a measure of equality, in, typically of income in a population. Switzerland has the highest equality between rich and poor when it comes to access to health care because the poor are not distinguished. They buy the same health insurance as everybody else. The insurers make sure that sick people can get health insurance, and the way they do it is, if I went shopping for health insurance in Switzerland, I would pay the price of a woman my age, 35. Whether I was sick or well, I would pay the price for a 35-year-old woman. So an insurer who gets me, what's your name, sir? And, so let's say Ed's an insurer. There are 87 insurers in Switzerland, which is the size of Massachusetts, and we have roughly, what, 10 insurers in Massachusetts? So let's say Ed gets me, and I'm very healthy. Ed makes a fortune. Let's say Bob London gets me, and I'm very sick. He's going to lose his shirt. Bob London's going to do everything he can to avoid me. So you don't want a health insurance where the insurers are highly motivated to avoid sick people, right? That's what we have, unfortunately, in the United States. So the way the Swiss do it is they formed a cartel of all these 87 insurers, and they take Ed's profits away from him that he has earned by cherry-picking the population, getting people who are healthier than average, and they give it to Bob. There's terrific consumer information, as you would expect. So what are the results? The Swiss spend 11% versus 17% of GDP. They spend more than most of the Europeans, but it's their choice. If they bought all HMOs, their healthcare expenditures would be 8%. Now, you might say, oh, yeah, the Swiss and the Americans, we're so fat. How could you possibly compare the Swiss and the Americans? Because you're picturing people running around lederhosen and kind of yodeling in the Alps. There are plenty of heavy people in Switzerland, and they have other diseases, much higher rates of alcohol and drug abuse than ours. But there's no question that overall they're healthier than the Americans. So is this comparison skewed? Yeah. But this next slide is astonishing to me. Their uh, Eurostat price indices have gone down since 2005. Healthcare costs have gone down since 2005. 
was that? It's a consumer-driven system. How did they make it happen? Well, they have 87 insurers. They're ferociously competitive because you and I are buying that insurance policy. Some of those insurers are nuns who run insurance companies up in the Swiss Alps. You know those insurance companies are tightly managed. Their administrative costs are 5%. That's lower than Medicare, um, much lower than our present system because it's a very competitive system and they have terrific health care. So this is the last time I'm going to show this slide. The rate, the CAGR, compounded average growth rate per person in Switzerland is 4.6%. While well, their GDP went up by 5.4%, for us, the rate of growth of, of our healthcare expenses, 6%, vastly outstripped our GDP. People want a lot of different kinds of insurance policies. Now, here's Congressman Ryan. So, what is Congressman Ryan talking about? He essentially would like to have the Swiss system in Medicare. He'd like to cash out Medicare enrollees and have them go shopping for health insurance. The Ryan plan um, also caps the increases in Medicare to the rate of increase of the consumer price index. That might seem very harsh, but we got to do something. I'm, I'm not advocating this system or against it, but we can't stay where we are with Medicare given the data that I started this talk with. And essentially, he's relying on Medicare and Rolies to do what the Swiss have done, and that is to force competition in the health insurance system. So, what kind of competition can we have in addition to reducing administrative expenses? Well, one innovation is the high deductible health insurance policy, which the Swiss have been using for a long time. Only a third of the Swiss buy them, even though they're the cheapest policies. What do we know about high deductibles? We know they lower costs. They are lower cost. Of course, they offer less insurance. But they also lower the rate of increase of costs of people enrolled in them. Do these people sacrifice their health status when they're not fully insured? If they're poor, for sure. Poor people with a high deductible, their health suffers. Middle income and above people remain in the same health status or improve, and they use information a lot. How do I know this? Because I read all these boring studies, and uh, I'd be glad to discuss them with you. But if I'm buying a high deductible with a first 10, 5,000 uninsured, a whole new industry will be created, which is the retail medicine industry that sells directly to the consumer without insurance. Things like retail medical centers, medical travel, LASIK surgery. Retail medical centers for what they do, which is a very narrow range of care options, are better and cheaper than primary care and emergency centers. I believe retail medical centers will emerge as places where people who have chronic diseases and who need help in managing them go to receive the support that they need. Medical travel. You could go to India and have a um, cabbage open heart surgery for 20% of the price in the US. Well, why would you go to India? Well, if you had a high deductible health insurance policy, you might be really interested in going to India. And the Indians are very accountable for the quality of their care. Why is that? Nobody's going to go to India unless they publish data about their risk-adjusted morbidity, mortality, infection rate, readmission rates.
So McKinsey predicts that from $75 billion to $190 billion will leave the United States and go abroad. When consumer-driven health care happens, which would clearly lower our costs, people roll their eyes. They say, this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to go to India. But these people, some of them may have rolled their eyes when the Japanese came into the automobile market and said, nobody's going to buy a Japanese car. So are the Indians cheaper because their standard of living is temporarily lower than the United States? No. Necessity is the mother of invention. The Indians have a fundamentally more efficient healthcare system than we because they don't have all this huge infrastructure that we have in the US. An easy example is the Indians rely vastly more on telemedicine than we do, which is clearly a very efficient, highly productive way of rendering health care. So if you think this is pie in the sky, Dr. Devi Shetty, a great Indian cardiologist, is opening a cardiology hospital in the Cayman Islands. Uh, he's built half of it. It's going to be a 500-bed hospital. He will sell you. Debbie Shetty is a world-recognized cardiologist. You can have your cardiac procedures in the Cayman Islands for half the price of the US. Now, I've gotten to know Debbie Shetty very well, but one thing he's never shared with me is his P&L. And the reason he's never shared it with me is I'm convinced at half the price, he's still making a fortune. So medical travel will happen. Services like LASIK lab tests will go public. OK, I'm just going to talk about a few more innovations and then go away. How many of you had yogurt for breakfast or oatmeal? How many of you exercise three times a week or more? How many of you do not smoke or have given up smoking? How many of you don't abuse? Never mind. OK. So <laughs> you do a lot to keep yourself healthy. Why don't you get rewarded for that? So in South Africa, which is a consumer-driven system, there's an insurance company called Vitality that pays you if you stay healthy. The Swiss have this kind of insurance policy, too, where if you stay healthy for five years, they give you half your money back. In Massachusetts, these, this means if I stay healthy for five years and I paid $18,000 a year, I would get back $45,000. Would that motivate me to stay healthy? I believe it really would motivate me to stay healthy. We don't have this. The Vitality has done a study of the impact of their payments. They've reduced the costs of diabetes by 20% by paying people to stay healthy. Why don't we have this nowadays? Because an employer is not sure you're going to be there five years from now when you're finally healthy you're going to be working for somebody else. In a consumer-driven system, clearly lots and lots of people would buy this important policy. The last two things I want to talk about are the changes in supply. Uh, we have a tremendously inefficient healthcare delivery system. It is hugely fragmented. It's as if it were in the beginning of the 20th century. Half of the physicians, we have nearly 800,000 physicians. My daughter is a physician, so I clearly have the greatest admiration and love for them. But half of them practice in very small, inefficient, unwired groups. Uh, we have 6,000 hospitals, which are islands unto themselves. We have tens of thousands of nursing homes. So everybody's looked at the supply end. I've been talking about the insurance end. The supply end of healthcare has said, 
these people have got to get consolidated. That's what happened in the rest of the American economy. We gained efficiencies through vertical integration and through horizontal integration. There's virtually no industry where I could talk about 800,000 hmm, and 6,000 hmm, of the size of healthcare. The question is, how is this integration going to occur? The healthcare reform legislation urges the formation of what are called accountable care organizations, or ACOs. These would be big, vertically integrated organizations like Kaiser or Mayo that could do everything for everybody. I am very dubious that they will be helpful. Do you know what this animal is? It's a mule, it's a mule. Usually people say it's a jacket, uh, but it's a mule. <laughs> so the characteristic of a mule is that it's sterile and that the great organizations that do deliver everything for everybody at a lower cost, Kaiser and Mayo, they are like a mule. Mules are sterile. They have been unable to replicate themselves. Why is that? It is very hard, both culturally and organizationally, to build these organizations. I am concerned about the challenge to the public welfare of this movement. In order to do everything for everybody, you have to be very big, billions of dollars in capital. That means there cannot be a lot of these very big places vertically integrated. So the evidence in healthcare is when the market consolidates, when there are mergers and something bigger is created, there is higher prices and frequently lower quality. Hospitals are consolidating all over the United States. Here's a chart from Massachusetts. The big red ball, what is that? It's partners. The CEO of Mass General is my former student, good friend. This is not personal. But our great attorney general found that partners charges 40% more than systems of equal quality that treat equally complex patients like the B.I. Deaconess system or Leahy or Tufts. So how did they do that? Well, Partners controls 50% of the physicians in the area. And clearly, if you have monopoly power, it does not necessarily lead to lower costs. That's what's worrying me about the ACO movement. That's just to data. So I think where we're going in supply is something different, and that is organizations that are integrated, but they're integrated around the 80-20, around diabetes, around AIDS, around cancer, around congestive heart failure, and they can do a lot of good because this is where all the money is, and they can reduce costs enormously. The average congestive heart failure patient costs $15,500. Congestive heart failure is the leading cause of unnecessary readmissions to hospitals in the United States. If the people who were involved in this complex disease talk to each other and manage to a common care protocol, they could reduce costs by $9,000 per person. What does that mean? Proper management of congestive heart failure through integration, not by doing everything for everybody, but everything for the victims of chronic diseases and disabilities like lower back pain. Congestive heart failure just in itself can save over a billion dollars a year just in Massachusetts. Last part of what we need is clearly consumer-driven system needs a lot of information. Otherwise, you're going to be a dumb bunny when you buy something. 
So people tell me, oh, I went to this doctor and he was fabulous. And I think, how the hell do you know? You know, what is it that makes you think other than that your friend told you he was fabulous? So call me old fashioned. I would like to see some data about this. And I think a consumer driven system requires the government to step in and require the publication of quality data just as it's done in other sectors. Uh, I believe we're going to go to this system pretty soon. Healthcare is enormous, but we're in a real crisis with healthcare. And uh, we were in a similar crisis in the early 1990s. It's gotten worse since then, but we thought we were in a crisis. We went from 0% managed care to 90% managed care in eight years. We're an elephant, but we move very fast. So to your good health, thank you so much. Our first panel here today, uh, we've kind of taken this approach of representing the four, four Ps in terms of different perspectives on, on the healthcare space. The three Ps, that the, first, the first panel represents the first three of those, um, providers, payers, and policymakers. Second panel will, will represent more practitioners, so a couple of physicians who are also engaged in a larger uh, scale. But on this first panel, we have uh, three folks. Uh, Dr. Bob Blendon, who is a professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard School of Public Health and also the Kennedy School here. He directs a program, an opinion research program here at Harvard. And his, his primary focus is on, on better understanding consumer perspective, public knowledge and attitudes on various areas of policy, most especially healthcare. Uh, he's co-directed a number of different studies uh, here at Harvard with the uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, also with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others, many of which have won multiple awards. He has been nominated uh, for, a, or his work has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He has won the National Press Club's uh, Award for Consumer Journalism. And he's the former chairman of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, Eric Behrens is currently the president and chief operating officer of the Beth Israel Deaconess uh, Medical Center. That was the small. We're the ones who are 40% more efficient. Considerably yeah. cheaper, I think, than, than partners. It's considerably more efficient and cheaper, uh, just to get that, that clear. Um, prior to joining uh, the medical center in 2007, he was the deputy provost of uh, Harvard University, so is as a legacy here with Harvard. And he has served as the executive dean for administration at the Harvard Medical School as well, led the development uh, in that uh, capacity of the uh, large um, research building on uh, the Avenue Louis Pasteur. I think that's the one right across the street from Boston Latin School. Right? Uh, uh, and then last but certainly not least, uh, Jim Roosevelt, who is the chief executive officer of Tufts Health Plan. Um, Jim has been president and CEO at, at Tufts Health Plan for about six years, since about 2005. Previous to that, uh, he is currently a, a CEO. He's also an attorney. We'll try not to hold that against him. Uh, he was the chief counsel at Tufts Health Plan prior to that. Uh, he is currently also the co-chair of the Rules and Bylaws Committee of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, he's served on an advisory panel to the, the president on health care and health care reform. And he currently serves as the chairman of the board of directors for the Massachusetts Association of Health Plans. He's also on the board of America's Health Insurance Plans, as well as Emanuel College, which I think you just came from this afternoon. Uh, no, commencement. Right. Sorry, next week's commencement. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, terrific. So this esteemed panel. I'd like to give each of our, our panelists here just a few minutes to, to share their perspective on on uh, uh, Professor Hertzlinger's talk and, and also where we are with healthcare reform. Uh, I'd like to start, Bob, with you, just in terms of from a policymaker perspective, your, your, your sense on kind of where we are with, with healthcare reform and why do we think it's different and what do we think might actually work this time or, or are we just doomed? Uh, uh, so first, by, by now you know that, that Reggie is one of the most profound policy thinkers uh, in, in our community. I need just to apologize for uh, a second uh, uh, I am the politics, public opinion person around the university, and at the moment, I live in a different plane than everybody else. And let me I explain. I think the biggest problem facing the United States is not health care, it's the polarization in American politics. Uh, and that polarization is making it incredibly impossible uh, to deal with all series of uh, major issues and has created great uncertainty about where we're going. 
So let me just talk about what it looks like uh, for me in, in healthcare at the moment. The, um, and I want to leave Massachusetts alone because Massachusetts is so important is that the Civil War has not yet broken out here uh, in the way that it has nationally. Let me take you in the just uh, quickly uh, voters in the 2010 election. If I voted for now the majority in the House uh, for the Republican, this is what I said to people when I left the polls. Uh, I hate the health care bill that was enacted. It's going to ruin the economy. I want this thing repealed. Uh, if I voted for the Democratic candidate for the House, I said I love this health care bill. Not only do I love it, I want it expanded. Uh, and uh, the Democrats it's, it, think that this bill is a shrinking violet. They want something a lot bigger. Uh, it has no impact on the economy. And so uh, what we've gone into, and you say, okay, everything's over, now we're moving ahead, that was all rhetoric. Uh, poll done last week, 80% uh, of Republicans said I want this bill repealed, 80% of Democrats said over my dead body uh, uh, for that. And uh, so uh, um, uh, briefly, uh, this battle is, is not over. And so uh, I'm going to take you into this and add to this the Supreme Court, which when I grew up never had an ideological or political value-based judgment. It just was a group of people in black robes. Uh, will somewhere between June and October decide the constitutionality of this bill? And I, I believe values will play a role in whether or not it is or, or, or is not uh, done. Uh, and so since the election, you may not have realized that the whole debate has been reframed and in politics, uh, Congressman Ryan and others get an A. So it's been reframed that the total issue facing the United States is reducing the deficit. Uh, mo I just did a briefing for reporters, and half the reporters in the room did not know that Congressman Ryan's budget proposal, which got him on the front page of The Economist, a lead editor on The Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, here is a leader leading, actually completely repeals the health care bill that was done, with the exception of the Medicare piece for reductions. So buried in his bill, all the money for, for the uh, uninsured is gone, just gone. Uh, and all the money for exchanges and technical assistance, gone. Uh, uh, for that. Uh, and uh, I noted to the reporters, we couldn't even get a conversation in the meeting uh, uh, about that. So is that going to happen? Of course not. It won't happen unless the minority party becomes the majority party in 2012. Uh, one of the things I have to let you know that the 12 front runners on the Republican side, and it t when you have only 10 percent of voters voting for you, you are a front runner. Uh, those uh, 10, uh, all of them will take a position so you can invest your stock to repeal this bill. So we're about to have a 2000 bill and people ask me, students, how will we be dealing with in two or three years? And I can't answer that question. I cannot answer that question because if the party shift, either part or all of this will end up on the cutting room floor. Uh, if the Democrats win everything in 2012, not only are we going to move ahead, Vermont is going to be a model for other things that, that we have. Uh, so there's uncertainty. What is important about Massachusetts is, uh, and it's so wonderful, I almost think when I come back from Washington, I need a passport to enter the state. Uh, and so when I had a chance to in introduce the governor, it, 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 it was quite amazing. This is the fifth year anniversary of the plan. I don't want to say it doesn't have problems. It does, it does have a number of, of problems. But basically somewhere between 96 and 8 percent of the population have insurance. It's the fifth year anniversary. Quite, quite incredible. The sun got up this morning and it was, uh, it was covered. When you look at the uh, polling results from the Boston Globe, most people support it. There's almost no movement to repeal the bill uh, within the state. There are no court challenges. Uh, uh, for that, I'm waiting for our Supremes to be sitting there saying, I got up in the morning and this thing just threatens the basic Constitution. In, 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 in fact, it isn't. But in the Globe poll, and what we're going to discuss today is the one thing on the public's mind in Massachusetts is they're afraid it's not financially sustainable. And so there's this unease, and this unease will show up in future elections in this state if something isn't done. Why is Massachusetts so important is that when the 212 election comes nationally, and if you read blogs from across the country, uh, you discover that actually people are dying in Massachusetts, they can't get care, businesses are leaving. And then if you read the editorials in the state, uh, it, it, it's like some wonderful country. But uh, uh, the, 
issue will be raised in, in the election, and they will say that, yes, Massachusetts did cover people, but they could never come to grips with moderating the curves. Uh, and as a result of that, if we care about the U.S. deficit, we can't follow Massachusetts. Because Massachusetts is just, and that's how we describe, as someone uh, uh, that that's uh, putting some sort of a narcotic in their bloodstream. They're just covering people and covering people, but they can't deal with this issue of moderation for that. So uh, the state, uh, which started out as a model for Obama, actually can could be quite extremely controversial if some way cannot be found. Uh, to move ahead, people are going to be throwing bricks, saying, you've had this for five years. You haven't looked at all at the curves that Reggie had. Uh, and, and you have to do this. So what we have to do. So let me give you what, what the trade-off is. And it was on the front page of the Globe. But again, everybody only discusses these things very narrowly. Uh, the state can almost afford 96, 98 percent covered. But it ran out of money, so we don't cover legal immigrants at the same route. And the court said today that you do have to cover it. Well, what's going to happen nationally is if we can't find a way to moderate costs, that's what's going to happen. Uh, what's buried in Congressman Ryan's, and I think if he was here, he would say to you, I, we, we can't afford to cover all these people now. America can't pay its bills. Uh, we have to pay our credit cards. We can't go out and cover 40 million people. And if we do, we can't cover it what they are. Well, Massachusetts could have a governor gubernatorial debate four years from now, which sounds a little bit like this. Great program. Glad you did it. We can't afford it. So uh, from my uh, point of view, uh, I would like to have Reggie's discussion about where we go. But it turns out, and it's not usually just say leaders are polarized, but people on the, the street are reasonable. People who identify with the parties are as polarized as uh, are uh, their, their leadership. So if you're not in my thought pattern, I can't discuss it with you across the aisle. This is a very, very serious problem. Uh, uh, for that. And we have to find a way out of this. And we also have to find a way to agree. And let us just agree the cost containment in the abstract makes so much sense. And at the human being level, it's awful. But we have to find some way to reach agreement how we would do this uh, and move forward. Because we're going to undermine any possibility of fixing some of the other pieces we, we have. And so when you watch the politics, it's not good about the future here unless we can do this. Uh, so every time you talk to Harvard alumni, I kind of believe they're leaders. And somewhere about being a leader is there must be a way to have a truce where we actually could discuss things like Reggie did and just say, let's talk, put the party thing down for a bit. Can we discuss some of these issues? and look at how we get from here to there without turning this into a complete uh, political thing. Quit. Jim, can we go over to you? And, and let's pick up this, this cost challenge um, from Bob. You know, it, it, one of your competitors in the state has gotten a lot of press about global payment systems. And it's kind of all the rage in the globe most recently. And you know, from my perspective, you know, we've kind of been talking about things like capitation forever. And our, our costs continue to escalate. So, any perspectives from you as a, the, the, the perspective as a payer of, you know, what about these global payment types of plans and other types of risk adjusted plans and, and you know, what, what about them do we think might work or not, right? Well, <clears throat> as, as Bob has suggested, in some ways Massachusetts is a microcosm and we can still talk to each other. And we were able to talk to each other five years ago because we, uh, we didn't quite start from, but we got to a position of believing in a shared responsibility. Uh, for all of this. Uh, and interestingly, every segment of the economy participated in that discussion, uh, employers, healthcare, education, uh, government. Uh, and interestingly enough, which is sometimes very different from the polarizing effect in the rest of the country, the faith community was very involved in, in uh, shaping this ability to talk to each other uh, here uh, around the concept of shared responsibility. But we made a very explicit, not, not, not implicit, not uh, uh, ignoring uh, uh, the, f the situation decision to do coverage first and cost second. Uh, and all of us who were, were closely involved in that and have stayed closely involved referred to, uh, refer to what was done five years ago and has been spectacularly successful in achieving its goal of about 98% coverage, which is about the Western European number, because there's always some categories that fall through the cracks uh, and, and, and transients and so on. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
we, that, we refer to that phase as health reform 1.0. And the next phase, cost, is health reform 2.0. And it's still very much uh, in development, sort of like uh, uh, Reggie's uh, programming experiment. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the governor, uh, this governor, who strongly supports uh, uh, maintaining what we've achieved, is also putting very heavy pressure on the rest of the Massachusetts uh, uh, economy and uh, and, and policymakers uh, to tackle uh, health reform 2.0. Uh, some uh, you know sometimes in ways that I don't fully agree with, but not, I fully agree with the effort and the framework that he's putting forward uh, to tackle this. Why? Not because health reform has cost too much in and of itself. Uh, in other words, health reform has not driven up costs significantly in Massachusetts at all. But because we were very expensive for health care here before health reform, uh, in some ways we were more expensive than the rest of the country. That IVF requirement that Reggie referred to is uh, close to unique to Massachusetts. We have 70 other requirements like that in Massachusetts. Uh, most states have about 30, and, uh, and hardly any of them have the IVF requirement that we have, uh, that we have uh, here. Uh, but uh, uh, we had found lots of ways, ranging from being very academic to, being, uh, to having all sorts of requirements, to be, be very expensive before, uh, uh, before we did health reform. Health reform, in order to get to the 98% covered, has increased the state budget by about 1%. Uh, so there's still a pretty good consensus here in Massachusetts. That's worth it. Uh, the Globe's headline today about that this ruling by the Supreme Judicial Court uh, adds huge numbers, actually. You're talking about 5,000 people that they said you got to cover at most. That's legal immigrants who've been here less than five years. Uh, the, uh, uh, so I think the headline was a little, uh, little overblown. It's the overall cost that raises the question of sustainability, yes, of health reform, but in fact, of our whole way of accessing health care uh, in this country. And uh, as was mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, in the early 90s, we did bring the growth of health care costs down to very close to, not zero, but about the, uh, zero over overall inflation. And we did that by uh, what is referred to generally as managed care, the tool used by managed care while there were a lot of comp a lot of components to how that to, to what you do to manage care, but the biggest financial tool is capitation. Now, capitation became a dirty word. In fact, uh, uh, Joe referred to one of our competitors, Blue Cross of Massachusetts, making a very big deal of their alternative quality contract, uh, and the quality part of it is very is very important and done in some innovative ways. The uh, Overall contract, however, is really capitation. The former CEO of Blue Cross, on whose watch this was originated, banned the word capitation within the Blue Cross building. Any uh, Blue Cross executive who used the word had to kick in five bucks uh, to, a, uh, uh, to a, uh, a bucket in the CEO's office. Uh, the, uh, uh, but it is a form, a, 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 more, a, a revised form of capitation. And I could tell you, if we had more time, which I think we don't, uh, what our, how we have built this into our overall contracting strategy at Tufts Health Plan, coming from having maintained a form of capitation for about 17% of our members, uh, of, of our HMO members, which is about half our population, half our HMO, half our essentially PPO, and that's mostly those who where employers take the risk themselves and we just do the administrative uh, functions. But we, for, we had maintained for the last 20 years about 17% in capitation, very high consumer satisfaction, very good financial results for providers, uh, actually, and good quality results, which we keep getting better at, uh, at measuring. Now, since all the discussion about starting to try to, to to get healthcare costs under control and there possibly being legislation, the market has begun to respond. 
Today, compared to 18 months ago, 17% 18 months ago, 41% of our HMO members uh, are under cap some form of, we call it risk sharing, but it means capitation, uh, contract, just double in 18 months. Uh, and part of that is because uh, we and providers and employers who pay the bulk of the bill uh, and uh, employees who uh, pay the rest uh, have come to realize we've got to do something. Uh, so I could tell you about how we try to coordinate care to make that work better, how we uh, uh, deal with unit price, to, uh, because unit price is one of the, you know, there was so much information in Reggie's talk. She only ran about 20 minutes over time. Uh, and, and you could have talked, but you could have, you could have talked for another two and a half hours and still had lots more, uh, lots more data to present. That's part of the problem in this uh, area. And all that, each piece of that data has some, uh, has some effect. But so instead of telling you how we get there, which I'd love to have a chance to do at some point, let me just tell you about why capitation should work differently and better this time. Uh, one basic thing that produced the backlash on capitation uh, 15 years ago was that uh, most employers at that point moved to, moved to giving employees no choice in the type of plan they were gonna, gonna be in. That Americans love choice at every level, whether it's choosing their health plan, choosing their provider, uh, very different from the British. By the, the British, I think, are outliers, actually, because they've made a budget decision to spend half uh, of what most European countries spend, let alone a quarter of what we spend, uh, a third of what we, of, of what we spend. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to run through some of the things that are different now versus 15 years ago. One thing that happened back then, more in California than here, but it's still part of the fundamental problem, was too much risk was placed on the provider, leading to what's sometimes called moral hazard, choices being made because we just have to, we don't have enough money to do otherwise, choices to not give care or to not make exceptions to let people go outside the immediate circle of providers when uh, clearly there was a better alternative for their particular condition somewhere else. Uh, this time around, there has to be a much greater mutual responsibility for care management uh, and the sharing of risk between the insurer and the provider. And by the way, some people say, is there a role for insurers in the new world? There absolutely is. Our business is allocating risk. It's using actuarial projections to allocate risk among all, our, all the people who pay us. That's not the business of, uh, of providers. Uh, the second factor is a much better demographic adjustment on who's covered uh, within, these, uh, within these groups. That was done in, if at all, in very primitive ways 15 years ago. Uh, and the demographics, the, the, the characteristics in age and, and illness of the population, we can now stratify much better within the group of, within the particular provider group and pay, uh, and pay more fairly. Uh, the, um, there was 15 years ago a minimal ability to manage appropriate utilization of new technology, to uh, analyze readmissions within 30 days of hospitalization and so on, uh, that we have much better technology today to do that. We're using it already in a coordinated system. Uh, it can help make, uh, make a more efficient system work. Um, similarly, back then, there was minimal ability to track patient compliance with medications, with follow-up care, drug interactions, and so on much better ability to do that, do that now. There are uh, whole sets of entrepreneurs who do this now. My Wellness Plan, Active Health Outreach, and so on. Uh, very minimal reporting back to providers of their own statistics in those days. Uh, that, and re most studies show that the most effective thing with getting effective and, you know, and the most economical care at the same time as the best outcomes with providers is just telling them how they compare uh, in their outcomes and how they look. Uh, th these, are, you know, these are people who, as kids, always did better than everyone else in school. You tell them they're not as good as their peers, they fix it. Uh, the, uh, 
there was a very minimal component of measuring quality then overall. Uh, our risk share model, like uh, Blue Cross's, uh, now has a much greater payment that is related to achieving the quality standards. Uh, you can do everything right and you're not achieving the quality standards. Achieving the outcomes as opposed to the processes and you won't get paid as well. Uh, and finally, products that we think of as aligning member incentives with the risk model. What uh, you heard described as high deductible plans, you can do that. You can get to it different ways and you sometimes need to for different populations. You can have what's called tiering of, uh, so that if you want to get a, uh, let's say, a, uh, a normal uh, delivery of a baby, you can go to Mount Auburn for $6,000. Uh, or you can go to Brigham and Women's for $19,000. The outcomes are slightly better at Mount Auburn. Uh, 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 only very slightly. Uh, the, uh, uh, but you pay, if you're not in a tiered model or if you're not in a high deductible model, you pay exactly the same. You pay $100. Uh, uh, we are all now developing products that say, you can go to Mount Auburn if you want to, and you'll have a $100 copay. Or you can go to Brigham and Women's if you want to, and you'll have a $2,000 copay. Uh, if it really makes you feel better to go to Brigham and Women's, do it. Pay for it. Uh, uh, pay part of it, and we'll still be paying most of it. Uh, the, uh, so those are, I think, the components for doing it differently this time. Uh, there's uh, a lot more that I'd love to talk about, but I probably don't have time until no, we well, get we'll, the questions. No, well, hopefully we'll come back, right. <laughs> uh, certainly on a number of points, Jim, but I did want to give um, Eric a chance to, to talk a little bit about some. So we've heard from the policymaker who says, you know, the, the issue of uh, horrible division between the, the, the parties. Um, I, I do want to come back to you, Bob, on this quality issue and consumer-driven uh, plans, because I'm sure you've got a, an interesting comment on that. But Eric, just your perspective, you run a large uh, academic medical center that's obviously much significantly more efficient than one of your competitors. Thank you for pointing that uh, out <laughs> yet again. Uh, yet again, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jim said, you know, this time around, we've got health care, we've got health care on a budget, right? The idea of the, these kind of risk shared plans, right? And now, better than 15 years ago, better demographics, better uh, ability to manage wellness and other things. What's the impact in terms of, from an operational perspective for you as someone running a large medical right. center? What, how, how do you see this? playing out in terms of what are some of the key themes you need to look at? It's going to be wrenching. Yeah. We know that. Um, we, I have the privilege of running a terrific hospital, one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. Uh, we'll point out yet again, provide terrific care comparable, we think, to anybody in the city at a significantly less costly care model. Um, I think that means that we're not the most expensive hospital in the state. We're maybe the fourth or fifth. Uh, out of 75 or 80 uh, in the second or third or fourth most expensive state in the country in a country that spends 17% of GDP, not 10% of GDP. So we're really close to the top of the cost heap. And of course, my place is an academic um, tertiary medical center. So we're the most expensive part of the care delivery system across what the professionals would call the continuum of care, from what goes on in your primary care physician's office to your community hospital to the big downtown expensive academic medical center to then those facilities that take care of you when you're discharged, whether it's a rehabilitation facility or a skilled nursing or nursing home end of life facility. So we're really very close to the top of the cost curve, um, but I think exquisitely aware of the fact that we've created a totally unsustainable system. That's why we just signed a capitated contract with Tufts Health my physician organization, 1,800 physicians spread across uh, eastern Massachusetts are in a risk contract, in the Blue Cross risk contract. And I would imagine that in a matter of a few years, we're going to shift the majority of our book of business to a capitated care model. But it's going to be wrenching for us because we have built a very costly infrastructure based on a fee-for-service model that has been <coughs> characteristic of this state for the last 20 or 30 years. What do we think we know about why things don't work. Well, we think the literature tells us there's something like 10 to 20 or 30 percent of care is unnecessary care. Well, what does unnecessary care mean? Does that mean that there are malevolent physicians prescribing medications that you don't need and doing surgeries that are, that are you don't need all? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. Um, what it means is that we do a really poor job of managing 
wellness and doing health prevention or illness prevention, um, keeping people out of the hospital in the first place, um, preventing readmissions. Uh, Professor Hertzlinger talked about congestive heart failure. Lots and lots of people who come to my hospital have congestive heart failure. It's the number one source of readmissions to the hospital. We have really lousy systems for managing what happens to those patients when we discharge them and send them home. We try to tell their primary care physician, but are they compliant with their medications? We don't really know. Um, are they sticking to the diets that were prescribed? Well, we don't really, well, why on earth, you might ask, haven't very sophisticated health delivery systems like we have in Massachusetts built this sort of infrastru infrastructure to help people manage their own health and wellness? And the answer is, under the current system, you can't get paid for it. You can't get paid for doing any of that stuff. You, the physician in the hospital gets paid when the sick person shows up in the doctor's office or shows up in the emergency department and gets admitted to my hospital where we can all spend thousands upon thousands of dollars in treating them. But to do the kinds of stuff that Dr. Carter was doing this morning in Mattapan, doing prostate screening examinations, I suspect that that was uncompensated work. And there's a lot of that go that goes on. And the kind of health and wellness management that our population needs back in the communities where they come from that currently doesn't get compensated. Now when we shift to a capitated model, things become quite different, okay? You'll still not get directly compensated for a lot of that work, but it will become cost avoidance. And already you see physician organizations and provider organizations making uh, intelligent cost benefit analyses. Does it make sense for us to now hire the nurse case managers, the healthcare workers, the visiting nurses uh, on our budget or on the physician organization budget to go out into the community and help these people manage their wellness and stay out of the hospital. Well, I'm not getting paid for that nurse's salary, but if I can keep those patients out of the hospital and that hits the capitated but yeah, then it does begin to make sense. So those sorts of things I think are beginning to shift. I do also think, I agree with Professor Hertzinger, the way in which we, we have dealt historically with quality in healthcare is a scandal. It's a scandal for the healthcare profession. I'm proud to say I think my hospital has tried to be a leader in that area. You can go to our website and you can look at objectively measured outcomes-based information. That's becoming, I think, more and more the norm. Unfortunately, there is no standardization in the healthcare industry about what actually, there's all sorts of measures that CMS imposes on us, that the payers ask us to measure, but there's no real standard, standardized definitions arising from within the healthcare profession on what constitutes the most meaningful metrics to measure. So we have a long ways to go, I think, in that regard. We know there's enormous waste in the system. In addition to, to overutilization and, and care that doesn't need to be provided, we know that there's simply waste in the system. It's amusing to me to pick up the newspaper yesterday and today and read about the disputes between the nurses union and some of the local hospitals over nurse staff ratios. An important issue, but we know from time and motion studies that the average nurse spends 10 minutes at the bedside per patient per hour. 10 minutes out of 60, okay? We know from time and motion studies that the average re resident or doctor in training spends 10 minutes per day per patient. Well, what are they doing the rest of that time? They're not watching television. They're chasing after supplies. They're doing unbelievably laborious and inefficient documentation. We just pulled 25 nurses offline for a week and had them work on reviewing the process of nursing documentation. The 156 data fields that needed to be completed every day for every patient that was under their care. And it looks like we figured out a way to take about a third of that documentation and form filling out. So can we increase the 10 minutes a day at the, at the bedside to 15 or 20 minutes a day? Would that be better for care? Would that be unnecessary waste taken out of the system? We think so. Professor Hertzlinger also mentioned art and science, and there's a lot to agree, although I, I might think that there's a little more science than she does. The problem is we don't use it. Um, we, are, we are loath in medicine to create standardized approaches to care. In the last decade or so, the phrase that's become popular is evidence-based medicine. And I always enjoy hearing that phrase, and I always ask our clinical leaders, well, what were you doing before? <laughs> 
but we have a long way to go in standardizing our approaches. There actually is voluminous literature on what constitutes effective and cost-effective care. We generate a lot of that literature here, but we seem extremely reluctant to apply it and standardize care to the greatest extent possible. Now, the, the dinosaur, not the dinosaur, the donkey system, the mule systems that are sterile um, elsewhere in the country, the, Kaiser, the Kaisers, the Mayos, the Intermountains, the Geisingers, uh, the Group Health Seattles, these are systems that provide better care and better outcomes at remarkably lower cost than we do in the Harvard system. So we have a long ways to go, but they all rely on highly standardized, highly protocolized, highly evidence-based models of care. And we're going to have to do the same thing. So Professor Hertzlinger mentioned three kind of key things up front in her, her talk, increasing costs, the quality issue, and then, of course, the access issue. So we've talked a little bit about the cost in terms of why we think we can try to limit, you know, put health care on a budget, right, and what we're struggling with there. This quality thing keeps coming up. And uh, Bob, I want to go back to you because you've got a, a a different perspective on this from the consumer research that you do on that. Can you talk a little bit about um, the issue of, of quality and the issue of how, um, not from, we've, we've talked about it, I think, from the perspective of, of the measures that we use have been kind of perverse. We're measuring process as opposed to outcome. But just from the, the public's perspective or the consumer perspective on looking at quality in terms of choosing their health care. So this is a very difficult thing. The more you uh, study consumers, the more humbled you are about what they believe. So what do most people, uh, when you talk to them about what they want to know about quality, it isn't what my colleagues measure. Uh, they want to know about mistakes people make. They believe that if you could put in the front page uh, of your brochure a, a list of how many mistakes Dr. Y made, X weighed, they would like to move from one doctor to that. Uh, they like to know about the suits against the doctors. Uh, and what they uh, have great fears about is being denied access to the uh, service. And I'll only be br brief about this. Last managed care backlash, it turns out part of my career was helped by the backlash because I interviewed hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, for that. And while my colleagues were talking about measures, five years later you were going up for that, uh, I was hired by network television to review what was going on. What was going on is a small number, but very visible, of physicians in systems were willing to take money and not provide service and pick some very visible things. Uh, so just so those of you, my colleagues, want to deny this, ABC News ran an interview with 1,000 physicians and a vice president of a major health plan. And this is what that vice president said. Uh, when we get tight on money on our capitation, I call up Dr. Schmo and I tell them to rind down the urgy centers. And so in our plan, which came out with a suit, they started telling them when people called on the phone and had a chest pain, they told them to call their nurse practitioner the next day. And uh, ABC had that on tape. So this was not a conspiracy theory. So they asked Professor Blendon, what would consumer think? Horrified. Uh, so that's why capitation is in, in mention. So uh, consumers are, are, are worried. Lawyers who said that this was not part of that episode, so they didn't have to get you the rehab because it was under the other thing that wasn't uh, done, and people were sent home without rehab. And you know what? No rehab can be cheaper uh, than uh, good rehab. So from a consumer's point of view, there are these very rare things that can happen that people really worry about. And they're not reassured that uh, five years later, his mortality numbers look better than his, so something will change. They want to know right now. So if you're actually going to go to very limited systems, you need appeal mechanisms that I do not believe exist, where physicians, nurses, and patients can say that I just have been told over the telephone not to do something. And I want a review, and that review cannot be paid for directly by the insurance company. You know, though this, everybody has review boards, uh, uh, average consumer understands if I get a check from Blue Cross to review their claim, I, I, I am not on their side uh, for that. So you have to remember that people are afraid as consumers about very things that could really hurt them. And otherwise, they are more loving of their doctor and systems that my colleagues say are not the highest quality. So people are not very discriminatory unless these things go on. But that's what worries them, errors, mistakes, withholding care. That's why they're resistant to some of these things being discussed. 
Jim, how do you, how do you address that from a, a, well, an insurance provider perspective? Uh, first of all, uh, it, just in terms of the particular uh, example of the, of the uh, uh, vice president of, I assume, a national for-profit insurer. No, it's actually non-profit. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. He, he, if he was involved, and, every, and every, everyone who was involved in, in decision-making yeah. there ought to, be, ought to be prosecuted, yeah. basically, in my and, in and my actually opinion. they were. But, yeah, uh, OK. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, but only because uh, it was taped. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> but uh, so one, yeah. thing I, uh, one thing I do need to differ on, yeah. we actually do have that review system here yeah. in Massachusetts. The state pays for it. Uh, and any denial of... Uh, uh, of care in Massachusetts uh, can be appealed, with, uh, and you are, you're guaranteed a decision within 24 hours uh, if sure. it's if it's urgent, or I think it's 72 hours if it's not if it's non-urgent. So we actually, again, and, and and there are some versions of that in other places, but again, we're kind of the uh, test case here. You got to have that. Yeah. Uh, the uh, I want to mention something about uh, well, two two quick things about Eric's institution, Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, uh, this week, they became the first uh, the first hospital uh, system in the country to be certified of, uh, as having meaningful use uh, of uh, 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 of healthcare IT. Uh, this is really significant. This is fundamental to everything that we're talking about here in terms of making the right choices and letting people have the right information. Uh, and by people, I mean consumers and other physicians. Uh, and, and so on, uh, and we have a long way to go uh, because healthcare has been and still is today the probably short of a shoe repair shop, the least uh, computerized industry uh, uh, in America. Uh, but uh, they're there, and, and there's a great model to follow. Now, going back to what uh, Professor Blendon said early on about the difference between Massachusetts and, and the rest of the country. Uh, just within the last six weeks, uh, uh, as this debate heats up, uh, uh, other uh, media outlets, such as the Washington Post, have started running articles that have been running for uh, months now in the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, about the disaster here in Massachusetts. Uh, they're, uh, they're always written by somebody who's not from Massachusetts, uh, uh, Dr. Sally Pipes from the Pacific Research Foundation. Uh, uh, is an example. She's in San Francisco. Uh, uh, responding to that, uh, and with the sort of data we've been talking about here, here today, about how a system can really work, first, about t three weeks ago, uh, the president of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and I wrote a letter to the editor uh, that was printed in the Post responding to that. A significant thing about that is that the US Chamber of Commerce is probably the biggest opponent uh, of change in healthcare, uh, particularly of access, but of all change in healthcare. This was written by the president of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and me uh, in the Post. Last uh, Wednesday, uh, Andrew Dreyfus, the president of Blue Cross uh, of Massachusetts, and the president of the physician organization at Beth Israel Deaconess wrote a joint op ed piece uh, in the Washington Post going further into contrasting. The way we have begun to confront, you know, the way we've succeeded on access and begun to confront uh, cost here in Massachusetts with the national debate. And I really think that contrast is fundamental. Uh, if the rest of the country can't get to the point of having, uh, of, of having a decision, that, a discussion that's not about death panels that never existed, but is about costs that do exist, not about uh, denial of care that uh, is, uh, even if horrendous, is only uh, anecdotal, uh, but about outcomes uh, overall. If we can't get to that, uh, then we're never going to solve this. And there are other, when I mentioned that there's other data that we could be talking about today, uh, the big, there are two big hidden facts in all that data about the different costs uh, in other countries. Many of these other countries have greater utilization of healthcare than we do, but they have better coordination of care, uh, uh, and they have. Uh, 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 but what they have is much higher uh, adjusted for inflation income of healthcare professionals, and that's another really tough question uh, for us to uh, for us to confront. I mean, like fifty to one hundred percent higher 
uh, in the United States versus Western Europe. Uh, compared to India, it's 200, 300% higher. So uh, uh, that's one factor. And the other factor is socioeconomic uh, adjustment. Switzerland is a great example of how to, of how to organize it. It is, a, a, as Professor Hertzlinger suggested, a country with much less economic divergence from the top to the bottom there. Uh, we have much greater uh, divergence, and that every time you look at economic divergence, that translates into different in, difference in healthcare status uh, in this country. Uh, it often translates into race and ethnicity. And then actually, until we can start talking about that uh, openly and what we have to do on both access and cost to redress that, we're not going to solve this. Right. Great. Eric, can you just comment a little on this coordination of care issue? One of the things Professor Hertzlinger was, uh, I think, was skeptical of the whole accountable care organization concept. And again, for you as a large you know, um, medical center in a city, how does that impact you? What, are the, what about this coordination of care thing? What is the impact in terms of community, in terms of going out to communities or community hospitals and right. your relationships with yeah. them? Right. Well, everybody in the United States right now is spending weeks reading the 445 pages <laughs> or whatever of the, the newly released accountable care organization regulations. Um, and I don't know what the upshot of that is likely to be. I mean, we're all going to have to decide uh, whether or not we want to apply to be an accountable care organization before the end of the year if you want to be in on the ground floor, I suppose. But whether we decide to become an accountable care organization, we're going to have to learn to be accountable for care. Um, we're going to have to learn to build infrastructure to manage care that doesn't currently exist because, as I said, in the, in the fee-for-service system, you can't get paid for that kind of infrastructure, so it doesn't exist. So we're going to build it now. And our physician organizations and the hospital, are, we're essentially collaborating with one another under these new risk contracts with Tufts and with Blue Cross to to hire the nurse managers and to build the IT infrastructure and to be able to, to push the data out to our physicians and the community. None of that stuff exists now. We're, I think we're really at, uh, at, you know, starting from, from scratch, but it's, it's absolutely got to be done because there's no way to, uh, to keep the 10 or 20 or 30 percent of care that is not really clinically necessary to, to prevent that from happening in the first place unless you do that. And by the way, um, correct my arithmetic, but if there's six million people in the Commonwealth, and it's about six thousand dollars per head per year. So, thirty-six billion dollars. If there's ten to thirty percent of that, could be prevented by better wellness and better coordination of care. I think that's a big number. So, any thoughts on that? Again, just like I said, you know, we've talked about capitation for a very long time. Uh, back in the early 1990s, I was on a consulting project at a, ho a large hospital center. We were talking about patient-focused care, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you know that, that's, that was the term of art back then. Now we're talking about uh, care coordination. Again, back to this idea of what are the aspects that we think now are in alignment that are going to allow us to actually move uh, in, in that direction that, that, that weren't there maybe before? I think we've got good systems for beginning to measure quality. There's still not agreement about the most important quality metrics, and I think there's a lot more that needs to be done about that. But I think we can measure quality, and we can, we can generate that data almost in real time. And I think that's foundational. I don't think that we'll be able to convince consumers that we're not withholding care for economic reasons unless we can do that. And I think that's incredibly important. And that's why the work on the information systems that Jim mentioned, I think, is also very critical, because that's a tool that allows providers and ultimately consumers to see what's going on in that regard. And I think that's incredibly important. Thanks. Um, I'd love to continue this for another three hours, just like Regina. Uh, unfortunately, we are somewhat limited by time, and I want to be sure we give our other uh, our other panelists uh, a chance. We will do questions at the end, uh, so for uh, for everyone here, uh, for all the panelists as well as Regina. Thank you all. The three, the, the our three. Come on up first. Um, Jacques Carter is um, an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Med School, and he is also a physician at the Beth, I Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, he serves as a senior physician there. Uh, he's also served as a, med as a medical director of the Prostate uh, Cancer Screening and Education Program for the Dana-Farber Cancer uh, Institute. And he has had a number of different clinical and administrative uh, positions over the, the last, last uh, many years. Ashish Jha is um, 
at, uh, an assistant professor, assistant professor at the School of Public Health, I believe. Associate, associate at the School of Public Health, sorry. Uh, and also associated as a, a physician with the Veterans Health Administration. Um, Dr. Jha really spends a lot of his time in policy and policy discussions, but I think as, as you characterized for me on the phone, uh, she's, uh, the perspective that you often bring is as, as a practicing physician to say, okay, is this stuff really going to work? Because we can think about some great things in a room as policymakers, but how do we actually make this work when, the, when, the, when we actually get down to the patient and how do we, how do we deliver that care? And I'd like to pick up with that and, and start with you today and, and, okay. and give you a chance to just give your perspective as, as a, you've sure. heard Regina's speech, the, the earlier panel, and, and now let's talk a little bit about that. Yes, you do. I have three slides. Sorry to inject slides at this late hour. Um, the first one I'm going to skip through because essentially this is what you've been hearing about for the last hour and a half. Um, which is that the fundamentally the healthcare system is broken, right? This is from a perspective piece in the New England Journal about a year and a half ago. Um, didn't say that the healthcare system is suboptimal, not working very well. It's broken. And if you look at who wrote this, it's, it's not some sort of radical flamethrowers. It's people like Steve Swenson, who's the uh, head of quality for the Mayo Clinic, Greg Meyer from Mass General, Mark Chasson, who, is, who runs the Joint Commission, Don Berwick, who's the head of CMS. So part of the question is, why do, we, why do people use terms like we have a broken healthcare system? So you've heard all about the $2.5 trillion in costs. And the real reason I'm using slides is because I want to show you this picture. So this is some numbers that we ran. Um, this is Medicare data. And this is looking at variations in mortality for acute MI. So it's a really simple idea, right? Right now, let's say I develop chest pain. Um, I will ask one of you guys to pick up your cell phone, call 911, and I'm going to get transported to a hospital, probably a big teaching hospital in Boston. And the truth is I have really good health insurance, and you would think that whether I live or die is going to be affected primarily by how quickly I get to the hospital and what my own risk factors are and how bad a heart attack I'm having. But I would argue that your, my chances of surviving that heart attack have a lot to do with which hospital I end up at, right? That there are hospitals in the country where the risk-adjusted mortality rate is 5 to 10 percent, and there are other hospitals in the country where the risk-adjusted mortality rates are 40 to 50 percent, right? Five to ten-fold differences for identical patients showing up with the identical heart attack. In the U.S., these are 2008 data, um, but but you know, this is, these are the latest data we have. And actually, the, the kicker here, of course, is we pay these guys just as much as we pay those guys. Actually, we pay these guys a little bit more. Um, so talk about a system that's fundamentally broken. Uh, and this is not about access. This is not about different si levels of sickness. This is what we have in terms of outcomes. And we've talked a lot about we got to get focused on outcomes. This is sort of where it is. So, here is, in my mind, when I think about what is the health care reform bill or all the efforts we've seen out of the federal government in the last two years, what do they do to try to improve the system and, and make the system a little less broken? I kind of put it in three buckets, and I'll go through them, and I'll just spend a minute on each of them. But we're trying to pay for what's good. That's going to be one of the new things. It sounds like a novel concept. Don't pay for stuff that's bad and make people accountable, right? So let's talk about those. Value-based payments, this is value-based purchasing. CMS is now going to take 1% of all the dollars that it gives to hospitals, withhold it, and then at the end of the year, redistribute it to hospitals based on whether they gave their aspirin and beta blockers for their heart attack patients or whether the patients walked out of the hospital satisfied. It's 1% of the payments. You can think of that as a baby step. People in the, health, in the healthcare industry think of it as a radical change. Um, and then we've already talked a lot about health IT. The government's going to actually start paying people more for using electronic health records. Um, don't pay for what's bad. Readmissions, we've heard a lot about that. There's an effort to start cutting back on payments, and there are probably going to be a small number of hospitals that are going to see small decrements in their payments based on that. And then here's a novel concept. We're going to stop giving hospitals extra money when they harm patients. Right? So we've done that pretty effectively for the last 10 years. And then you wonder, why have we not made great progress on reducing harm in hospital care? It's because hospitals actually got paid more when patients were harmed. Now, I'm not saying people, therefore, were doing it to make money. But I'm saying the incentives clearly weren't aligned. Um, Medicare is making an effort now to not pay extra money to hospitals 
when they harm patients. That seems like a reasonable place to start. Um, and then you've heard a little bit about accountable care organizations. I, too, am deeply skeptical. Actually, it's the only time in my life that I've read all 445 pages of a federal regulation. <laughs> I would not recommend it. Um, it was incredibly painful, but I got through it because I actually wanted to understand what they were trying to do. Um, there's other things like it, like the patient-centered medical home, which is all of this is trying to figure out how to, how to make providers accountable, not just for the single episode. So you come and see me as a physician. I should be accountable not just for what I do in clinic that day, but really for the broader episode of care. And I'll kind of finish up with this last thought, which is so all of these, I think, are good ideas. Um, to say that they're baby steps, I think, would be in some ways generous. Uh, there are going to be a whole set of unintended consequences that are going to come out of this. And the people who love to bring up those unintended consequences, I get it. I plan to study them. This is what I do as an academic. Um, but the problem is that not doing any of this stuff is really not acceptable, right? Right now, sure, we're, the people have problems with pay for performance. Right now, we have pay for performance. It's called paying for quantity. The more you do, the more you get paid. So moving towards quality as inadequate as those quality measures are, and I think they're pretty inadequate, is a pretty good step forward. Um, and then the kind of last thought is, I do think we're in a, you know, we've sort of tried various efforts like this in the past. It feels to me, and I haven't been practicing for that long, but it certainly feels to me like a totally different context. This is a time when the president and, you know, and, and Congressman Ryan, the fundamental debate they're having about the budget is about what to do with Medicare. This is not a niche issue anymore. And with, you know, I agree with Bob's notion that maybe even bigger than the healthcare cost issue is our polarization. But right after that is the fact that we don't know how to deal with healthcare costs. And uh, so I think these efforts are going to get real traction. With that, I'll stop. Great. Thank you. Jack, you've been practicing for one or two years more than Ashish. Uh, <laughs> and and as, as Eric pointed out, you, you run a, a prostate screening uh, effort that uh, probably over the years has had various funding challenges. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on, on, on that type of outreach as we think about putting the patient in the center of what we're doing and, and uh, yeah, well, I, the I think I, Yeah, I, I think I have to think about um, the role of, of uh, my, my, my role as a primary care doctor and how we in medicine, uh, doctors are often thought of as being the operators, the engineers of the healthcare system. We are, well, of course we aren't. We think we are, but we really aren't uh, because the systems are run by administrative people and, 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 and business types. Um, and we've sort of given up some of that uh, in our efforts to practice evidence-based medicine. And I think as time has gone on, we've found more and more of our time being spent in pursuits that are non-clinical. So I spend certainly, uh, and my colleagues spend maybe two-thirds of our time doing things that have absolutely nothing at all to do with laying hands on patients. That is that we spend gobs of time with paperwork, forms, uh, telephone calls, things that are not reimbursed, time-consuming things that perhaps adds some quality to the healthcare system and perhaps does good things for our patients, but in the long run is a drag on the system and, and does nothing to help reduce costs or help with the quality issue overall. The, the whole notion of the, uh, the health care reform was, I, I guess, the, 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 there was some political exigency to getting this done at a, in a certain way, but a whole piece of this reform was to, one, save costs and to cover everybody. And, uh, and, I, and as we look at this whole system, I'm not sure that, one, we're going to save any money. It doesn't look like that because the costs keep rising, and we see a lot of plans that hope to, in fact, hold down costs, but I'm, personally, I don't see how it's going to be done because we do not have, at this point, the controls to do that. We don't stop people from getting additional CT scans. We don't stop extra blood work from being done. We don't talk to uh, the other hospitals about what's going on with our patients. My patient can be at the MGH uh, for a headache, come to see me. I don't have the CT scan. If I can't get it, I've got to order another CT scan. Uh, the system pays for that, and over and over again, um, a GEMS a health plan will cover the cost of that because it seems indicated based on what's going on with the patient. So we have to find ways uh, uh, to, uh, to have the systems talk. There, there are certainly efforts afoot to do that, but to have the systems talk about records, about health histories. Uh, we as Americans have to give up a little bit of, uh, of our freedoms and, 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 and put some information online that, that may put us at risk, for a security risk for people knowing what's going on with us. But, but we have to do that if we want to save some real costs, because the real costs in the system are not so much the patient coming into the hospital, the patient seeing the doctor, you know, three times in a month, 
but getting extra CT scans, um, uh, purchasing uh, uh, durable equipment that is, uh, is not used properly, uh, 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 being bombarded with a million forms uh, generated by some computer somewhere that if you don't sign into within the hour, you're going to get two more. And that goes on over and over and over again. And I think that we have to look at a way to make this system, even in the city, you know, we've got enough hospitals, certainly the big teaching hospitals that, that I think care about each other, that we can actually find ways to communicate so that patients, in fact, get better care and things don't fall through the cracks. It happens a lot. From, from the prostate standpoint, which is a screening issue, I believe that, that we need to spend a lot more time looking at prevention, public health issues and prevention, um, and not so much on some of the acute care medicine that we do. We talk about that. We've been talking about that for two decades. But there's always a tough issue of where to get the money to start doing the preventative stuff when we're spending all the money on the acute stuff. And we're never going to get the money to do the preventative stuff until we take some money away from the acute stuff. So I think that there's a lot of issues related to how we, how we uh, proportion the, 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 the resources that we use to take care of people in this country. And unless we start having better communications, uh, we're just going to keep spending more and more money. And, uh, and we're looking at 20 percent at some point of the GDP for health care costs. With probably some of the same quality issues. So the idea, this idea of putting healthcare on a, the healthcare on a budget, right, or, or kind of figuring out how to make things more efficient. Ashish, you, you've done a fair bit of work on uh, electronic record, electronic medical records. What are your thoughts on, you know, this efficiency issue? Is there hope there for us? Yeah, so you know, it's actually spent a large chunk of my time thinking about the electronic health record sort of situation in the U.S. So a couple of big picture numbers to, to understand. So there's some good news on the electronic health record front, EHR front. 35% of doctors are now using an EHR. Okay, so that's up from about 15% five years ago. Um, and about 15% of hospitals are using an EHR. Those are still pretty dismal numbers, right? So the question is why, what are we doing about it, and what's the payoff that's gonna happen? So the biggest reason why is these systems are incredibly expensive and disruptive and if you do it well and you get efficiencies out of it, the provider who put in all that money doesn't get to see any of that efficiency because most of it leads to reduced billing, which either can financially hurt you or let at most come out neutral. So the government has this big subsidy program going on called, uh, through something called the High Tech Act, um, where if you are a meaningful user of an electronic health record, you get extra incentives from the government. Um, there is no doubt this is going to catalyze a lot of people who've been wanting to switch over from paper to electronic. I mean, there's sort of this sense of we're in the year 2011, and 85% of hospitals are still primarily paper-based. I mean, I don't know if that strikes anybody else as crazy, but it just strikes me as kind of incomprehensible. There are a lot of people who want to make that switch. I think the federal efforts are going to do it. The problem is that a lot of my colleagues who love EHRs even more than I do have way oversold its benefits in the short run. So there's been this big talk of how it's going to save us tens of billions of dollars. Actually, I think in the short run, it's going to probably increase healthcare costs. Uh, in the long run, if we do a lot of other things and try to bring real competitive market forces into the healthcare system, I actually think EHRs will have a huge role to play in creating efficiency. But in the short run, I don't see a big payoff. Big payoff on quality, big payoff on safety, but not a big payoff on costs. But isn't it also one of these, there's some phenomena that occur in healthcare and certainly in other industries as well, but this strikes me as an example of a situation where on its face, electronic medical records just seems to make a heck of a lot of sense. Yep. So yeah. the question is, okay, well, why is it so hard? And you know, you kind of, we get into that, we think, okay, from a policy perspective, then we get into privacy issues and other issues. And, all of a sudden something that seems quite simple, yep. or should be something that should be quite simple, all of a sudden starts to become very hard. Is, yep. that, is that kind of yeah, unfair? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, when I teach students about this, I, I say the value proposition for a doctor's office goes something like this. Um, it's gonna cost you about $50,000 per physician. It'll make you about 20% less efficient for about a year. But if you do a really good job, it'll save the insurance company some money. <laughs> what do you think? And shockingly, majority of physicians have said, you know, I'll wait. <laughs> um, and, then, and then people like me come in and say, how can, you know, how can majority of doctors not have electronic records? It's crazy. Well, it is crazy on the face of it until you dig a little bit and you realize the way we've structured the healthcare system, it's not crazy at all. And in fact, it's, it's remarkable that anybody has decided that this is a good idea. Um, 
but I think the evidence that it's going to help improve care is incontrovertible. It's, it's the cost stuff that's more challenging. Terrific. I'm mindful of the time. I know that uh, I think I said at the, at the outset that we have a, a program that we have speakers could easily present at a, a week-long conference. And in fact, we kind of have the makings of a week-long conference right now squeezed into two hours. So uh, thank you, everyone, for, for bearing with us. I did want to think about, we have talked about the four Ps that we have represented in terms of perspectives. Um, there's one, or at least maybe one or two, that are also in the room that we haven't yet given the opportunity, and that is the public and the patients, which is all of the rest of you. And so I want to give every, the, the folks in the room just a chance with all of our, our panelists and, and, uh, and Regina as well uh, for thoughts, questions, concerns, things that were confusing, things that were particularly lucid. Um, anything back here in the, in the blue? Uh, the most interesting points that I picked up throughout the thread of the conversation was around the information intermediaries and the fact that there's a lack of standardization and broad use of data in a way that could be structurally used as opposed to independently used, whether it's with an insurer who does it on their own or whether it's through a systemic approach. Could you all talk about how you would see the evolution toward those information intermediaries in practical terms in the U.S.? Uh, I know, Professor Herzinger, you mentioned the government, and I'm wondering if they are the source. Is it going to be insured pro excuse me, private insurers? Will it be institutions? How do you see that evolving over time to where consumers could make rational decisions based on quality? Let's send that to uh, so Jim first. We yeah. have a number of collaborative organizations here in Massachusetts trying to deal with just, just that right now. Uh, there is so much attempt at collaboration going on that it's overlapping a bit. Uh, uh, and we're now working on how to get this all on one, uh, on one page. Uh, government has has an important role and maybe a sort of ultimately deciding role. Uh, 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 what was just mentioned in terms of how do you uh, how do you get it right in terms of what is uh, what will get physicians to participate? Well, one way you get it right is the government can provide money. Uh, uh, another way you get it right is to have a at least a common set of not prescriptive things to do, although checklists are useful and important, uh, but, uh, but at least a common language so that they can communicate. And indeed, in our, and, and the market is useful here because there are entrepreneurial solutions out there. It can also work in the other direction. There's some of the resistance to what's called interoperability, which means not that one system's uh, electronics talking to another, uh, it has been competitive. Uh, a, you know, if, if your records are only all in one place, if you stay in our system, it's an incentive for you to stay in our system, uh, and so on. So it's going to be, I think, a combination of government, uh, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship, and collaboration among the players in the healthcare system. Sure. Eric, do you want to build on that, just in thinking about the information technology component? Yeah, I, yeah. I think I agree with Jim. It's actually worse than that. I mean, I think for ye the early years of the electronic medical record, provider organizations were uh, locked into proprietary systems by software vendors, and then they, in turn, tried to lock in their patient population so their patients couldn't go anywhere outside their system of care. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, it's got a, now in the Obama bill, there is a mandate for interoperability, and the, this infrastructure of interoperability is beginning to be built. But what we're really doing is un unwinding the last 15 or 20 years. <coughs> Virginia, you had a thought, too. So uh, in 1934, when we had the Great Depression, uh, it was one of the causes for if you bought a stock, it was like picking a doctor or a hospital nowadays. You knew nothing about it. What I'm going to say is odd, given who's sitting next to me, but uh, we had a great president at the time. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, <laughs> and Roosevelt was urged to nationalize business, much like many people think insurance industry is bad, hospitals are bad, doctors are bad, blah, blah. Nationalize it. Nationalize yeah. right. uh, But Roosevelt rejected uh, that, and he said, I'm going to create a transparency agency. That's the words we use nowadays. And he created the Securities and Exchange Commission which required transparency. And they may say, oh my God, you know, given the financial mess, we have the lowest capital costs in the United States.
is because of the great transparency that was mandated by the SEC. I think it's a wonderful model. I'd love to see it used in healthcare where the SEC says, you know, I don't want you to screw around with the effect of options on dilutions of earnings per share. You get it into your financial statement. I think it's a very appropriate role for government. Go ahead, sure. C could I ask a quick question? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we're going to make Just that. very quick. Um, we hear a lot about bending the cost curve. Is that decreasing the increase in healthcare spending, or is that somebody losing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, we'll go to Bob. Uh, both too. parts of that are probably true. Uh, well, so decreasing the cost curve, uh, some people have, have an ideal that we can actually reduce the cost of health care. I actually think that is probably totally impractical. Uh, because I can give you a, a health insurance policy at 1965 rates if you don't have MRIs and you don't have antibiotics and so forth. You wouldn't want that. Uh, so some of the things that cost money in health care are things that we, want, that we want to pay for. Uh, the, uh, uh, but by the things we've been talking about in terms of information and, uh, and disclosure, uh, I think you can, re you can reduce that trend. It, are some people going to be losers? The answer is, prob is probably. There, there are people who do very well under fee-for-service. There are, I mean, one of the big controversial questions is the fact that we pay specialists multiples of what we pay primary care physicians. Uh, we don't yet have an acute shortage of primary care physicians in Massachusetts. You do in some parts uh, of, the, uh, of the country. That's another one of the things that's said about people who don't know what's going on here. We don't have a, you can get a primary care physician appointment uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, not necessarily with Dr. Famous, but, you, but with, uh, with a very good doctor. Uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Famous is probably sitting up yeah. here. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but Overall, if we give everybody access to care, and remember there are states with 20 and 25 percent uninsured, big states, Texas, California, uh, yes, there will be a shortage of primary care physicians. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, we had a huge shortage of nurses in this country. Uh, and we were bringing in nurses from the Philippines and from Ireland and so on. Now the shortage is of nursing school professors. Uh, many more people want to become nurses, men and women, than we can, uh, who would be qualified to go to nursing school, than we can educate. How did we get there? We doubled what we pay nurses in this country. That was the market working. Uh, and uh, if we increase what we pay primary care physicians, unless we want to continue this trend, we're probably going to pay specialists less. That's another one of the things people don't like to talk about out loud. Let's go with the woman in the, in the orange over here. Um, yes, I have a question, but before I ask it, just quickly, the electronic health care record problem will be solved because any child born after 1990 will no longer be able to handwrite based on my children. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's going to be a lost skill. Um, Except in block capitals. <laughs> right, right. Um, and this, the second thing before I ask my question, with all the references to IVF, I believe there's a new study that's just come out that actually shows that by doing IVF, you can actually save money because the procedure of IVF is so exact and precise that you will probably end up with a singleton birth, whereas if those who don't have access to IVF use more primitive methods, um, they're more likely to end up with multiple births, and we all know how expensive um, uh, newborn intensive care is. My question, in terms of consumer-driven health care, what percentage of the health care cost is currently controlled or driven by consumer decisions versus health care practices, either by hospitals or clinicians, so that if consumers are going to change all this, how, how much control do they really have, and do they perceive that there's a need for a change? Well, consumers clearly perceive there's a need for a change. That's what all this cost control issue is about. So some people portray consumer-driven health care as being 
I would go into the emergency room and I would stir up and say, no, I don't want you to do that. Now, that's clearly ridiculous. I would say that to the physician. So consumer-driven healthcare is about people choosing insurance policies that meet their needs. And uh, they control that nowadays, and they would control it more directly in a consumer-driven system. For example, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, employees now have a choice of one insurance policy. In a consumer-driven system, you would have a choice of a lot of insurance policies of the sort I talked about. You might want a high deductible, you might want an HMO, you might want something that pays you for all the torture that you put yourself in getting healthy. You might want one, if you're sick, that bundles or capitates the care for your disease, and you might want to choose from a variety of providers who can give you that. So people do want that. They would like to have a lot more preference, a lot more options in their choice of insurance, and clearly they can control that. And people who don't like consumer-driven healthcare kind of uh, demonize it as the patient lying on the table, the physician's about to make a cut in their chest and they rise up and they say, no, you know, I know better how to practice medicine. That's not what it is. But because I was talking more about what control do consumers currently have. I mean, in the private sector, um, there are businesses right now who offer their employees the option to choose health care benefits few. and stuff like Very that. Um, but most, I was also talking... Most, most businesses offer a choice of one. Yeah, okay. Th that's what I was getting at. How yes. much control do they have Very, now? Very and how little. much um, does other consumer decisions, for example, litigation and malpractice have not been brought up? And yeah. that's a huge issue? Well, my I, personal feeling as I visit the halls of Congress and see a lot of el elderly men uh, who are lawyers, uh, that I don't think that's going anywhere. <laughs> you know, that's so, call me cynical. <laughs> it's something I would love to see change, and, uh, but uh, realistically, I don't think it's going to happen. You could have an insurance policy that says, you know, if the doctor practices evidence-based medicine, you're not going to sue. And this insurance policy is going to cost you X. Or you can buy an insurance policy where you sue no matter what happens, and that's going to cost you Y. Y is going to be hugely greater than X. I'd love to see that kind of, <laughs> of policy. It would force the consumer to internalize the cost of this idle litigation and destructive litigation. I wish I could be more sanguine about you know, uh, rec uh, legislative tort reform. Adam, see it. Jim, do you want to add on that? And then we'll go here to the gentleman yeah, in, the, so in just, the blue uh, blazer next. Uh, right quickly, uh, the biggest problem in consumer choice uh, right now is information uh, that people don't have except for the kind of reputational or brand. We didn't, didn't actually use the word brand as well as size, uh, making a big difference in people's uh, uh, choosing to get their care at a particular place. In terms of having incentives, that is changing. 50% uh, of all the new coverage that we write these days is either high deductible or, uh, or uh, major tiering. Uh, and so that is beginning to change, just like global payment is beginning to change from market forces. There is a, if you'll forgive me, it's, uh, there is a saying under the fee-for-service system, however, most of the, uh, uh, the fee-for-service system without information for patients or physicians uh, results in, some people say, the most expensive uh, piece of equipment in a physician office is the pen uh, because it's the doctors who mostly make the decisions about what else should be, uh, should be done. Uh, and so we have a long way to go on that. On malpractice, I agree. I believe that the only, uh, the things that you read about in terms of absolute caps on, on uh, coverage. First of all, it's not going to happen in most states. It's happened in Texas. hasn't lowered costs at all. Uh, but uh, what would make a difference would be uh, 
uses of protocols, and if a, uh, if a pro uh, provider follows those protocols, there's a, uh, an automatic dismissal. You can still sue, but it's dismissed at the very first, uh, very first level. And that would deal with somewhere between 2 and 4% of the cost of health care. That's the estimate for what uh, malpractice. Bob, do you want to? Uh, it, it just to be mildly controversial, uh, just because they're, in my world, interviews with thousands of people uh, seeking care. Uh, Gallup just put out a huge one. And uh, what they discovered for the 15th time is uh, people don't use this information that Ashish wants to provide them. And let me explain why. Uh, market uh, analogies don't work well because average people made a decision in their mind that they think is smart. They trust their principal doctor a great deal. I do not trust my car salesman. I surely don't trust the person who does my investments for me. And so it's completely different. So Gallup asks people, how long do you, how often do you challenge the recommendations of your doctor? It's low. Uh, their study after study, here is the heart surgery rate. Okay, look to the doctor. I'm not going where you're sending me. I'm going where Ashish's stuff. They go where, where, where you tell me. So it's not that we don't have the technology to really understand this. We're about to make a big mistake to think that average citizens are going to pour over books uh, when they have pain in their chest or anything else. I'm leaving alone the choice of insurance, a different thing. But we're producing a lot of clinical outcome measures. And uh, they, they don't use it. And so this is what it looks like. And I'll, I'll quit. The, even though I'm at Harvard, who do I survey? The majority of American adults have not graduated college. I'm sorry, they didn't. The majority of elderly, many of them have not even completed high school. Giving them books of measures, he's a six, she's a four, she's a 12, this is an aberration of people who went to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 sorry. Uh, so can I just, can, can I respond to that? Go ahead, please. <laughs> Right. then we have the system where the physician that gives the advice uses the data. Right. Not that we're going to put it on a billboard so, uh, and people are going to choose that. So, so, the, um, so the evidence is in, and you're absolutely right, Bob. Consumers do not use this information. And I completely agree with you that it's, it's a fool's errand to try to get consumers to second guess their cardiologists about which cardiac surgeon to use. It's a bad approach to this stuff. Um, where it has a lot of effect, is not even the cardiologist. Believe it or not, they don't even use this information, which is frustrating because you're like, come on, you're a cardiologist. <laughs> it's the cardiac surgeons who use this information. When they look, when they're out you know, on the golf course, they say, by the way, Bob, your mortality rate is twice as high as mine. What's up with that? <laughs> um, and that actually has a profound impact on people quitting. So we actually have very good evidence that high mortality surgeons quit at a much higher rate. They leave. And that is causal in that direction. It's not going the other way. Um, so it actually has a very profound effect, but not in the traditional market mechanism way. And that's why we ought to continue doing it. Plus, I think it's just a good thing to have more transparency in the system. But it has the way it works. And so we still have people, like Consumer, uh, Consumer Reports now has a health thing. And they're going to be doing consumer health. And I've actually been sort of informally consulting with them. I'm not convinced even those guys are going to get consumers to start picking hospitals based on their you know, sort of red circle versus black circle kind of stuff. I don't think it's going to work. But it will have an effect on the hospital. So I totally agree with that. And that's why we publish that kind of outcomes information on our website. because Not because we think consumers read it and come to our hospital because we have good outcomes, but because our experience is when we put it on the website, divisions and departments and work units inside of our hospital that we're seeing bad results got better in a hurry. Right. right. Yeah. I, know, I know we're very short on time. I want to just go to this one last question from this gentleman here who's been waiting patiently. And then uh, perhaps we have some time after just to... Thank you. My name is Charlie comment. Atkinson, and I have a couple comments and a question. Uh, the comment uh, is that I think that Dr. Herslinger's consumer-driven approach to solving this problem is compelling and obvious. That doesn't mean that, the, and I think the solution is to get the leadership to orchestrate a vision that gets the whole country behind and in alignment with the kinds of things that she and you all have said. To me, one of the biggest obstacles uh, uh, is McCarran Ferguson that gave a monopoly. And I'm interested in your comments. Thank you. Take the opposite position from that in a real world situation. 
sure. Do you have one? I think so. Okay. Um, as some people drive, uh, they go through Connecticut, and it happens I'm from Hartford, which is approximately the poorest city in approximately the richest state, and has some serious problems now. We really haven't addressed some of the disparities, which not only ruin figures, but I think make a consumer-driven <coughs> approach inapplicable looking at the population and the comments that we get. It also happens I'm a legislator there in Hartford. And um, I, I remember some things having come here 20 years ago thinking about the durability of the HMO movement. Some of us joked around, well, it'll be 15 or 20 years before it's abandoned. We might have been approximately right. And I have to wonder, uh, in, also in terms of the consumer-driven healthcare, whether that also will have a limited lifetime. Because I see so many populations where the information is dismal. The choice is not there. The, the, the recourse of many people is to the federally qualified health centers, common in Boston and some other cities, because people have, may have nowhere else to go, and a question of choice, uh, consumer-driven choice, is just inapplicable, I think, except in the populations with the greatest access to uh, computers and uh, suburban clinics, uh, suburban offices, and so on. So there's, there's so much to be said. Of course, there's not time. But about some of the, the issues in terms even of, um, of consumer demand, reducing it, while the, all the advertising of the pharmaceutical companies and the surgical companies is to increase that demand, often inappropriately. And we have failed as legislators and as a population to, to cap that, uh, that profit-making stimulus with truth about what is really helpful to healthcare, whether it be screening uh, or, or other things. I mean, it may be that there are some people in, in this room that have uh, incipient breast cancer or prostate cancer, but the profit, I must say, is not there, as Dr. Carter has said. And so if we have a system driven, I think, by, uh, by, by uh, consumer choice, but it's so heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry, the medical technology, the advertising, how would, how would one expect uh, not only an uneducated or far informed <coughs> person, but an ordinary person to discriminate these things, unlike for an automobile or refrigerator and so on. So that brings to the argument we all go around, is the, is the traditional market approach applicable to a healthcare system that is to be a patient-centered medical home, preventive, and so on. So uh, th there's plenty to say, and, and I don't expect uh, full agreement, of course, but I think the question at least has to be raised. Right. I think your comment is an important comment and that the heart of a yeah. consumer-driven system like Switzerland is the poor person in Switzerland is not a poor person when it comes to buying health care. Right. She has as much money as the average Swiss and because she has as much money as the average Swiss she has the same range of choices as the average Swiss. I think that's, that's exactly what we want. Right now, Medicaid's a terrible system. Medicaid, actually, although it's better than not having insurance, it's shameful. So many physicians will not see Medicaid patients. When it comes to information, um, information is the lifeblood of the American economy. So uh, the airline industry became transformed because of good information. The automotive industry, you know, foreign <coughs> cars are now the number one selling cars in the United States because they're better and cheaper, and we know they're better and cheaper because of the information. Now, does every single person have to know that the Toyota is better and cheaper than um, some American-made cars? Of course not. But if enough marginal consumers know that, we change the market. I, I disagree with my colleagues about the impact of information on consumers. We don't have good information. You know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that's not what I want to know. I want to know what Bob talked about. How many errors did this doctor make? Where can I find this information? If we had that kind of information, consumers would respond to it. Right now, they have 
boxes and boxes of metrics that are not relevant to them. And when people have information, they act on it. You don't need a degree from Harvard to understand that a doctor who kills nine out of 10 of his patients, probably not a great doctor for you. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mary. And thanks, thanks to everyone else. I, I hate to shut this down because the way we're going, I think we're just going to start getting interesting about midnight. But uh, I, know, I know we are going get, to get, get thrown out of here very soon. We do have uh, refreshments just down the hall, I believe. Uh, straight outside, uh, the left upstairs, we have a lovely reception in the Williams. Thank you to everyone here, and thank you to all of our guests. And we'll